We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, here is a warm greetings from uh, IGF in Katowice. Uh, I think you can all see us in the room. And um, welcome you all to this UNESCO session on the Internet Universality Romix Indicator, which is really the several times discussion since we developed the indicator also through and at the IGF. Um, it's my first time to moderate this uh, hybrid session. I, I can see you. I hope you are also able to see and uh, hear us very clearly. Um, uh, as a beginning, I would like to uh, just uh, structure the discussion a little bit uh, because there'll be a three hour discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are going to have a several semantic uh, uh, discussion sharing according to the different areas uh, on human rights. We'll invite uh, seven speakers from different countries to present their assessment and uh, then on openness, then on access and then more stakeholder as well as a, as a methodology. So please do stay with us for three hours. It'd be very exciting. Um, I think I'm the UNESCO ADG and a director yeah. Uh, they, are, uh, they are stuck in another meeting. They will also come and to interact with all of us. To give all of you an uh, overview of the project, uh, um, I'm going to uh, present jointly with uh, uh, Mr. David Suter on the implementation of the Romex Indicators project. So uh, may I ask our technical support to, uh, to present our first PPT and uh, to project on a screen? Thank you. Thank you. Wait. So, I would just uh, say a few words before I hand over to David Suter, who is the best positioned to uh, unpack the indicators themselves and also the unique strengths of this framework. You know, this, uh, this year, the 16th of IGF is a hybrid. Despite of the pandemic, we have seen so many people coming here and we all share the same passion, same dream to have an internet united. By internet being united, it's not just about uh, connectivity, about the infrastructure, it's also about uh, the internet not, not to be fragmented, the policy, the regulatory framework should be also harmonized at the global and national level. That's why I see the value of UNESCO's Rome principles and also indicators we have developed to really give teeth to ensure those universal values are being mainstreamed to all levels of internet governance. So uh, what exactly are those 300 indicators uh, to measure these four uh, main principles of Rome, which means human rights, means universal access, multi-stakeholder, and also openness. Um, David, do you like to take the floor and uh, to tell us what are, uh, you are the, really the main architect of this Romex toolkit, uh, and tell us what are exactly in there, since I know that um, many participants attend our events maybe for the first time and also what are really the real strengths of this uh, toolkit. Thank you, David. Please take the floor. Um, okay, thanks, Xian Hong. Um, I'll give a very brief description of the Remix indicators. Um, I suspect that most people in the session are familiar with them, so my apologies if this is going to be a bit repetitive, um, but there are, there are two versions of the indicators. There's a full set which has 303 indicators and the core set which contains 109. Um, and why so many, i uh, often asked, because we're trying to enable you, the researchers, um, who, uh, who to put together a, a picture, which I've often called a collage uh, of the national internet environment in the country, um, to put that together that picture from the information that's available. 
And the scope and scale of that information will vary greatly from one country to another. Um, there is no country, um, I think, where it will be possible to answer every question out of those 303. Um, but in every country, there should be enough scope to build a picture from what is available and draw conclusions from that. So there'll be substantial variation in, the, in what you actually need to do in, in the different uh, contexts. Most national studies to date have, uh, in fact, I think all to date have focused on the core set of indicators. Um, but we hope you'll also look at the others in the larger set and um, reflect on those and include those being particularly useful to the country concerned. Um, so the next slide, um, if it comes up, will um, show that the indicators are grouped in five categories. Um, and just to summarize that again for you, the four, uh, four of these are the overarching categories in UNESCO's concept of internet universality. So that's rights, openness, access and multi-stakeholder participation. And the fifth draws together cross-cutting issues which are concerned with other themes that are important in assessing any internet environment, themes of gender, children, sustainability, trust and the legal and ethical dimensions of the internet. Now, none of these categories is intended to be more important than another. Um, uh, none should be given um, less attention than the others in the analysis. Each of the categories is divided into themes. Each theme has a number of questions and there are indicators attached to each question. And those indicators fall into three main types. Uh, some are concerned with the presence or absence of legal institutions or norms. Some are quantitative. Uh, and some are qualitative, so they're concerned, for example, with the perceptions of experts or the wider public, material that is derived from commentary rather than numbers. Um, all of these sources, including the quantitative, uh, need, need to be treated with caution uh, rather than taken for granted. All of them need to be interrogated, not just about what they say, but about why they say it and who wants them to say it and what it is that isn't being said. Um, so what's missing from the record? Uh, the next slide um, shows the process and reporting structure that UNESCO asks those who are using the indicators to follow if they want their reports to be published by UNESCO. So first, uh, and critically here, uh, studies should be multi-stakeholder in character. Each of them should have a multi-stakeholder advisory board, which should be supported by a research team, that draws on all stakeholder groups. So to be valid for UNESCO publication, a Romex study should not be led by one party, by government or business or by civil society, and it should not reflect uh, the interests of one party, either a stakeholder community or a particular organization. It should genuinely be collaborative and its recommendations should be based around consensus within that multi-stakeholder collaboration. Data should be gathered critically. Um, the aim is to learn as much about the internet environment as possible and to learn from links between the different themes and categories. So it shouldn't be a box ticking exercise in which in each indicator is treated separately. Um, that's important as a starting point, but it should then move on to look across the theme uh, and across the category and across the whole internet experience of the country to see how different issues interact and what might be done um, uh, in addressing them holistically. So a good report won't consider just answers to individual questions, but how they fit together. And it will make recommendations that encompass the internet environment as a whole, as well as responding to the specific issues of individual questions. It's important too that the recommendations aren't just aspirations, aren't just things it will be nice to see. Um, they should be practical um, and practicable. They should be things that can be implemented now or in the near future um, by the different stakeholders involved. And that will make a difference to the internet experience within the country in terms of the different uh, sections, the different categories of rights, of openness, of access, of multi-stakeholder participation, and of those cross-cutting issues that are addressed in under letter X. And so to go back to the slide that Zhen Hong had up initially, which I hope is still the next one, just to summarize some of the key points here, this is the one. Um, so the Romex framework is holistic. It doesn't cover every aspect of the internet. 
but it does cover a set of aspects that are critical within UNESCO's mandate um, and to the internet's ability to live up to deliver on its promise. It emphasizes the citizen within the internet in terms of rights and access and actions that governments and businesses and other stakeholders should take. Um, so actions not just to benefit themselves, but also to benefit citizens, and not just the actions they should take, but also the actions that they should avoid. Um, I think thirdly, it provides a, a methodology for holistic multi-stakeholder assessment. So it's something that seeks to build on the evidence that's available within a country, identify where there are gaps, draw people together with different perspectives into a discussion about the best way forward that uh, achieves their various goals and recommend ways of moving forward to the benefit of all. Um, and lastly, I'd say it's a work in progress. So we've had around 30 countries uh, making use of these in one way or another so far, and um, you know, that, that reveals weaknesses as well as uh, strengths. I think different countries' experience has pointed to some ways in which these, and of course the internet itself and the wider digital environment are constantly in change. Um, so it is our intention, Shan Hong, is it not, to review the framework in the light of this as we move forward. Um, and I'll hand back to you now. Thank you very much, David. I have heard you presenting this framework many times, but really every time I hear new insights, that's exactly the beauty of this role mix because it's so inspiring. Every time we get new thoughts and aspiration from it, simply to uh, illustrate what I have said that, uh, you know, uh, since we introduced the role mix indicators in 2018, I mean, on voluntary basis, we have seen so many countries, increasing number of countries embracing Rome principles. They are using uh, Romex indicators to assess. It's like a diagnosis tool, like a doctor. If you want to know if the internet in your country is healthy or is sick, you can use this as a very comprehensive diagnosis to check if all works well, is there anything missing, is there any problem, and then eventually can formulate the recommendation actions to fix them. As you can see from this slide, I like to congratulate all those countries on this slide, and also uh, like to congratulate those leading researchers also uh, in this meeting. Uh, this is your show to showcase what you have achieved in a certain country's assessment, what you have observed should be reformed, should be improved uh, in at a policy level, and uh, and for the future, what you recommend to 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 take action, and that will also be a very useful exercise for the other countries across five continents to learn from the exercise we are having here in 33 countries. And then we want to have more countries in to use this uh, toolkit to assess the internet ecosystem in their country, uh, because uh, it's really universally uh, relevant to every country's internet uh, policy making. Um, as David Sutter just mentioned that uh, the multi-stakeholder advisory board, this inclusive process is a key to guarantee the success of the assessment. See in every country, the first step to compose such a advisory board consisting of governments, private sector, technical community, civil society, NGO, human rights advocates, gender specialists, everyone, regardless of a pandemic, they are convening a regular meeting to supervise and guide scientifically the research. That's a key to the success of assessment. That's also a very uh, innovative experiment of approach of having put in place the multi-stakeholder approach at a national level. Um, then uh, the assessment will be uh, completed by a national validation workshop to have all stakeholders to look at the results and then to debate on the recommendations to reach a consensus, what should be the next step to take to fix the challenges, to merge the gaps, and also to expand the achievements. 
Um, although this is an internet governance forum, the, dis the discussion has far gone beyond the internet, uh, same as the internet universality. Wrong principle is much broader than internet itself. It's equally applied to all the digital transformation aspects, all the digital technology. This slide shows the AI and the ROM framework. As you know that uh, UNESCO has recently endorsed the first global instrument on AI ethics recommendation in the 41st General Conference. It's the first global standard setting document, which also well uh, recognize the Rome principle I and mean, human rights humanistic approach as uh, the basis universal value uh, underpinning the AI policy and AI development. At this IGF, we are also going to convene uh, the first uh, uh, dynamic coalition of Romex meeting on Thursday. We are already having uh, so many uh, supporters and advocates and partners to support this project morally, uh, financially, uh, spiritually, and professionally. We do look forward to receiving more interest from all stakeholders at IGF to expand this coalition to promote Rome altogether. We are advocating this at all kinds of forum, not only IGF, all kinds of regional and national initiatives. And also we uh, liaise with academia through the IMCR. We liaise with the, uh, the private sector and also other different uh, strong actors through different stakeholder meetings. So please do approach us at, on all these occasion to join us to promote this principle and also trying to apply them to your national context. Even this indicator also are found relevant to certain actors. For example, we also see the uh, ICANN and the Internet Society, they found the certain category of indicators on access can be very useful for their work. Same for the NGO, for the academia, as they can pick anything from this package to use for their uh, daily research and work. For well, next steps, uh, you know, um, we have been rolling out for three years with uh, 33 countries. For next step, we certainly want to have more and more country to assess the indicators. But also, we also rec recognize the fast uh, development of technology and policy. We are going to review the impact of the indicator project. And also, we are going to update the indicators themselves. Imagine there are new, uh, new movements, uh, new policies, new challenges to be uh, considered in this mix for achieving universality of access to information. So the so we are it's a rolling process. We do uh, count on all of you to contribute further. Uh, we are doing the global consultation to take in and the inputs on updating these indicators themselves. And also we are going to improve the quality of the national assessment because it's a very complex assessment. We recognize the need for more technical support from our national researchers and actors in strengthening the multi-stakeholder advisory board and also in collecting data and strengthening the methodology to ensure the results are really neutral, solid, which you can formulate into the, uh, the sustainable action. And uh, on our side, we are also going to support this dynamic coalition by restructuring a new uh, online platform for all stakeholders to easily follow up the implementation of the indicators in each country. On this map, in our future platform, it can be dynamic. If you click uh, Thailand, if you click uh, Kenya, uh, Brazil, you can see uh, all that has been done on Romex indicator, ranging from the assessment uh, to the activities, to events, to the implementation of the, of the recommendations, et cetera. So that can also be very useful to share good uh, experiences and lessons learned among all the countries. So thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to introduce the 
uh, the semantic sessions. Uh, different from last year, we organized the sessions by regions. This year, we organize them according to the semantic areas of indicators. For the first semantic session, we have invited seven speakers representing seven countries' assessment of Romex indicators across five continents. But I'd like them to share first the overall uh, progress and the situation in the country, but also to focus on their key findings and the key recommendations on human rights indicator. As you can see from this slide, we look at free expression, right to privacy, access to information, freedom association, and broadly on social, economic, and cultural rights, as well as the cross-cutting indicators. As you can see from the screen, uh, the gender equality, uh, empowering use, how internet uh, contributes to sustainable development, development uh, the trust and the security issues, legal, ethical aspect of digital transformation. So I'm going to invite the seven speakers. Uh, I hope they are all online. Maybe my co-moderator, Karen, could you stick on to me? And uh, I think they are all here with us. So the first, uh, um, speaker I'd like to introduce is uh, the leading researcher conducting the Romex assessment uh, in Ethiopia. Can you hear me? Dr. Asra Mulatu. Are you there? Dr. Can you Mulatu. Me? Could you please unmute yourself? If you are not here, Ah, so I'm sorry, I just saw the Karen uh, text that the uh, doctor is having some connectivity issue uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, don't worry, please try to connect later. So now I'm, I'm uh, introducing a second speaker, Madame Sadaf Khan, representing the research in Pakistan. Are you there? Sadaf? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so Dev, uh, floor is yours. Please uh, let us know what uh, your what's your major finding in Pakistan, and uh, what do you suggest on improving human rights online in the country. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's an honor to be the first speaker. <laughs> Not something I was looking forward to, but yeah, um, adds a, little, a bit of pressure on me. But thank you so much. It's great to see the process um, come this far. I became involved in the um, in the process of development of the Internet Universality Indicators while the indicators were still being developed. Um, so I have like a lot of regard for the kind of hard work that has been put into this framework. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. So, um, Janio, I think your screen is going to um, get turned off with that. So, I hope yeah, that's please, all right. Please share uh, a screen, and um, I think our technical supporter will, uh, yeah, is projecting your screen. I can see it now in the room. Okay. Yeah, please start. Thank you. Okay, so um, at the beginning, I would like to just give a background of what's been happening in Pakistan. We launched the um, assessment for the Internet Universality Indicators um, earlier <clears throat> this year. And because the pandemic was still um, raging when, when we started the process, um, we, we have had a few troubles related to our inability to get people together physically, but um, still we managed to put together a pretty good multi-stakeholder advisory board um, who have come together online multiple times um, to help us getting the research so far. In terms of the research progress, we are, hold, we are holding our validation workshop tomorrow, so good luck to us on that. Um, but yeah, we are at the stage where, where the findings are with us and we are um, kind of looking at developing recommendations um, that are <clears throat> truly uh, multi-stakeholder in that regard. So moving on to the thematic findings, I'll start with the rights. Um, I hope that my screen is properly visible um, to everyone. So in the area of rights, um, just to keep on time, I'm going to be sharing the very basic findings 
at this time. So what we found in Pakistan is both good things and bad. The framework, if you look at it, is based on three thematic areas within the rights principle that start with digital rights and constitution in the law. Um, so what in Pakistan, our key finding is that the constitutional protections do provide the provisions for digitally relevant human rights. Pakistan is a signatory to almost all the relevant um, UN human rights mechanisms and has signed on to most of the resolutions um, in which the digital rights and internet governance has been discussed. There are limited legal protections for freedom of expression, right to information and privacy, especially when it comes to the online provisions. Um, and that is not for the lack of laws themselves. There are a number of laws. Um, the limitation, and I have said limited legal protections, the limitation comes from the fact that a number of restrictions on, um, on speech and expression um, have been put in place using very vague subjective terms, which allows for the abuse and misuse of law in sometimes. Um, moving on to specifically the content regulation of digital content, there has been a lot of criticism locally, nationally, um, on the lack of transparency and oversight mechanisms. The content regulation um, <clears throat> is carried out through our telecom regulator, PTA, and uh, the, gov the government, the Ministry of IT, have been involved um, in implementation of other, of other laws dealing with privacy, freedom of association, etc. Uh, but the main criticism is not on the legal instrument itself, but the lack of transparency in how that le those legal instruments are implemented. There are prevailing challenges, not just because of subjectivity, but also with regards to the human resource, the technical resource that is required um, to implement laws dealing with cyber, um, cyberspace effectively. There is a lack of understanding. There is lack of capacity within the legal community within the judicial community specifically um, in dealing with digital digital specific issues. Um, in some cases, we have seen really good role of judiciary. So while the online off offline equivalency of rights is not directly coded into legal instruments, we have some great examples of case law coming in from higher judiciary that does create that equivalency um, and that does use legal protections that have been prescribed in general laws onto the online space. <clears throat> Moving on to theme B, the, um, the B and C, which deals with freedom of expression and access to information. Um, this has been a challenging area to assess because right now, um, and actually since 2020, this whole area uh, dealing with content regulation online, the regulation and governance of digital content, that's something that's completely in flux. Um, at least two new major policies have been introduced, um, either discarded in the middle and one that, that's going to kind of define how digital content is regulated in Pakistan has been challenged um, in the high court. Um, I'm one of the amicus here is appointed by the court on this, this um, particular case, by the way, which, um, you know, just having been, uh, just having conducted this ass assessment is really helping me put together my brief for the court as well. Um, the restrictions on speech, the restrictions on regulation, the content takedowns, they come majorly in the category of blasphemy. So if you look at transparency reports pushed out and published by most of the global corporations, the content that is restricted on the basis of blasphemy is almost half or more than half of the total volume of content that's restricted. Um, now here a bit of contextual um, understanding. Pakistan is, is an Islamic country. The name of the country is Islamic Republic of Pakistan. And blasphemy is a highly volatile area. Um, so dealing with blasphemy in the law and outside the law and you know these restrictions, this is a really sensitive um, theme. So even though um, there are multiple, you know, there have been multiple rec recommendations during the UPR process, during other UN human rights instruments regarding dealing with blasphemy online, this is a very critical and difficult area for our regulator and governments to deal with. Um, additional concerns and the main area of concern that I have pointed out in the larger report as well are restrictions that are based on decency and morality. Now, decency and morality, as everyone can imagine, is a very subjective um, thing to kind of outline. And in a community that's as diverse as Pakistan, more than 40 languages spoken, multiple um, communities living, decency and morality has been something 
on which there is a social conflict that that pre-exists and now is being translated to the internet. Um, we have a history of blocking platforms. Um, most recently, TikTok was blocked for the first time and online game PUBG um, was also blocked and then unblocked um, by the PTA. In the past, we have also faced a block of the U of YouTube, the platform, um, for over lasting over four years. So this is one of the areas on which the, the challenge in the code um, is based on. Then on freedom of association, um, what we found is, is some documentation. There is some documentation, media reporting of structured, inauthentic um, hate campaigns against online organizers, especially for feminist online organizers and women um, who are politically active or who are based, who are associated with journalism. Um, but there is no evidence of direct interference from the government. Now I'm pointing this out because if you look at the indicator, it talks about direct interference from the government in online association. So while that evidence doesn't exist, um, there, there is documentation that some um, politically motivated or seemingly politically motivated campaigns have been um, have been you know unleashed to disrupt political organizations um, especially around women's day especially when feminist organizing in the digital spaces is taking place um, and that inauthentic structured activity includes both hate speech and incitement to violence it does include um, disinformation morphed videos etc so it's pretty obvious that like some kind of resources have been spent on it um, again the the rules that i've been talking about the ones that have been challenged in court dealing with content regulation tries to also decriminalize misinformation um, so that's that's a very delicate kind of a difficult issue to deal with because we see um, deliberate harm um, being done online against feminist activists specifically um, and other political actors but then obviously criminalizing misinformation is, is also something that's not um, as straightforward as it seems. Around privacy and data protection, um, so privacy is, is a constitutionally protected right, so it is recognized as a fundamental human right. However, when it comes to digital, we do not have a data protection law as yet. Um, the data protection or personal data protection law has been in works um, since 2017 when Pakistan signed on to the Open Government Partnership. Uh, and multiple drafts of the research have been discussed with the public. They have open, been open to the public. Um, there are limited legal protections that exist currently, um, specific, which, which are kind of sectoral protections. For example, in the banking sector, protection exists. Um, in, in the business sector, there are some protection exists, but overall data protection framework is still missing and there are prevailing challenges in the implementation of the laws that are there. Um, and there have been multiple incidents of data leaks from both public and private bodies. Regarding socioeconomic um, and cultural rights, e-health facilities have really picked up during COVID. Both government and private facilities um, have mushroomed. However, challenges of access remain um, because you know accessibility is still limited. There's no, we do not have universal access and the ability to use the internet is also limited. Um, Pakistan is one of the lower ranking countries in the network readiness in, in, index in which people and ability of people to use the internet that's fairly limited. So even though e-health facilities have mushroomed, online education systems have mushroomed because of COVID in the past, um, in, in 2020, the accessibility remains a huge challenge. Um, there is no indication at all of the digitization policy with regards to culture and cultural rights. So that's a gap that we have identified. Um, sorry, I'm going very fast because I want to ensure that I finish in time. So in terms of recommendations, I've listed out just three here. Um, a, there is the legal framework. There's a question of legal framework. We do have um, a reasonable legal framework, but um, after talking to the experts, after discussing the findings with the civil society, etc., cetera, what, um, what we have found out is that the issue lies more with the process of legislation rather than just the legal instruments. So one of our... Core recommendations is, is the improvement of multi-stakeholder consultative process for policy making. Right now, we do have a multi-stakeholder process. The data protection law, for example, as I said, has been in consultations over the years, um, but the process itself is problematic. There have been concerns about the lack of transparency, about um, the lack of back and forth, about the logic, um, reasons behind what recommendations are accepted and not accepted, who's invited to the table and not invited to the table. So in terms of legislative process, which is 
involves multi-stakeholders. Um, that is the first step in ensuring that pro the process with terms um, of rights improve. Then there is a recommendation to create human rights audits. So not just um, for the policies that are dealing directly with rights like data protection law, but all the policies that deal with the cyberspace. So for example, crowd policy, the broadband policy, which are all being uh, in different phases of being formulated. Um, what we are in, in, you know, what we are recommending is creation of a space to include Ministry of Human Rights, the National Commission, um, the National Human Rights Commission, and private and you know human rights digital rights activists to conduct a human rights assessment on all policies that are related to ICT, whether they're related to business development um, or anything else, even if they're not directly focusing on rights. And finally, for FOE and RTI, increased transparency and creation of oversight mechanisms and removal of terminology, subjective terminologies in the law um, that are being seen as good, you know, important first steps. I'll quickly go on to the cross-cutting indicators. The um, gender has been one of the most um, I think overlooked parts. This, this has the most concerning findings in Pakistan. Um, there are political, social, economic, infrastructural challenges that all exist. And because specifically because of the social and cultural challenges that occur, that exist with regards to gender and ICTs, this area is difficult to document. And this, this area is difficult for the government, I guess, to target through policies as well. However, we do have the widest mobile digital gap in Asia, and we are one of the countries with the biggest gender digital gap. Um, so this is an area that requires a lot of priority. Unfortunately, we are not seeing a lot of that. There is um, a subsection dealing with ICT for girls in the target set by the Digital Pakistan policy, um, but they need to be improved much more. And a detailed strategy for achieving those targets has not been made, um, that has yet to be made. Again, with regards to women, legal protection exists in cybercrime with regards to safety of women, but implementation has remained a consistent challenge. The FIA, um, which is the law enforcement body dealing with, the, with cyber crime cases, um, has released reports year after year that show that the largest um, amount of cyber crime complaints come from women who are being blackmailed, who are being uh, harassed, um, whose private information is being leaked. So there is there is a, a huge backlog in dealing with the crimes that women do report. And because of cultural constraints, most of the cases are not reported at all. Um, so that, that gives one of the definitive um, action points, one of the definitive gaps that Pakistan, um, the policy needs to develop and the implementation and practices needs to improve. In 2020, a group of over 160 women journalists released a statement um, against online rising online abuse by political workers. Again, the government is not the government was not named or any political party was not named, but essentially the statement talked about how women are consistently targeted if they are if they verbalize political opinions. Um, and, and it has been one year. There was a there was a hearing in the National Assembly as well. Um, but the situation, unfortunately, remains pretty much the same. So women face abuse, but if the women are vocal and prominent um, journalists or activists, they face um, significantly worse and targeted abuse in the digital spaces. Um, <clears throat> the government's policies have kind of focused on creating one program called Beti, which means daughter. Um, <clears throat> which needs improvement. Regarding children, there is a complete data vacuum and um, there are legal amendments. <coughs> Sorry, I need water. <coughs> Sorry about that. So the policy on children seems to be completely focused on protection from child abuse and child pornography. Um, which obviously is not enough. And that's something that we are, we are kind of also proposing and working on. Um, the perception data is, is a bit concerning because it shows that 48% of the respondents think that you know it's not at all important for children to have access to internet, um, which is not true in today's this day and age. So that is also something that indicates an area where the government might need to work on. I'll move on to the recommendations because I'm already over time. Um, but yeah, so for the recommendations, 
um, obviously data collection is still the first recommendation. We do not have any gender disaggregated data that's released by public bodies, that's released by official figures, and household surveys are pretty limited in their approach. So they might be indicative of some trends, but they are not, this is not exhaustive, comprehensive data um, that policies can be built on. So that's um, one of the areas that needs to be covered. Then rather than focusing on ICT for girls programs, which are very focused on, you know, creating spaces to encourage girls to use this or that. Um, there's a need for all policies to be gender responsive, gender sensitive and inclusive. So we do need, we do see a chain, need for change within all the different policies that are dealing with IT, um, ICTs and all the other digital spaces. Um, prioritizing children is obviously important. They're missing for policy. So, um, creating safe digital spaces for children, creating strategies to increase media information literacy among children, creating policies to make sure that schools are imparting um, good ICT education, inclusion, etc. That's something that needs to be focused on. And finally, focus on social barriers. This is one thing we found missing in the policies. Um, and through our own research, not the assessment, but uh, our own research and other researches that are focused on access and women, the barriers to access, it's very apparent that families, family values, access to mobile permission from families, cultural, you know, uh, perceptions around women using ICTs are one of the main barriers stopping women from using mobile phones and the internet. So a lack of focus on dealing with these um, negative perceptions that that create one of the main barriers um, is not is, is, is not optimal, you know, it's not really good. And that's a focus that needs to be built into the policy. So I'll stop there. Sorry for going over time here. Um, back to you, Jen. Thank you so much. I didn't want to interrupt you at all because all you have been presenting are so substantial. It's amazing results from your research. I do hope that uh, this PPT will be linked and shared on our website later on so all those stakeholders can access to know more about your research. And um, uh, it's really too short, I mean, for any country to be presented in five minutes. Uh, so I do uh, appreciate your uh, contribution. Thank you, uh, Sadaf. Now I'm introducing Matthias Ketman to present uh, the Romex assessment uh, from Germany and particularly focused on the human rights and the gender uh, cross-cutting issues. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, wonderful introduction. Um, uh, if you would allow me to share my screen, I could do that too. If you, uh, sure, sure. Has to do that. We have excellent uh, technical support in the room. They are going yeah. to uh, promote you to a co-host, so you'll be able to share your screen. I very much enjoy any promotion. <laughs> Immediately. As does the um, as does UNESCO with its you know promotion of, uh, of of human rights through the application of internet universality indicators. You know, yeah, I'll, so just, uh, I'll just start, okay? And uh, I didn't I, see your screen yet. So could um, you, uh, Mr. Sir, could you please? Promote Matthias to share his screen. Can he do it now? Now it looks fantastic. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much. That looks wonderful. Yes, we see your excellent uh, graphics. Please <laughs> go ahead. Sure. Thank you very much. Just one second. There we go. Hi again, I'm Matthias. Uh, the beautiful man behind me is Fredo. He's uh, the creator of uh, the uh, German uh, broadcasting system and the uh, person behind the name of our institute, the Hans Fredo Institute, Leibniz Institute for Media Research. And we conducted the uh, indicator study on behalf of the German UNESCO Commission, the team of Professor Schultz and myself. Um, one of the key success factors we found was an excellent uh, cooperation with the political uh, establishment, which helped tremendously in accessing data. Uh, the chair of our uh, advisory board, for instance, was the German cyber ambassador, uh, Ambassador Greenberger, who called the uh, report in the, in the final version a, a milestone for digitalization uh, uh, in, uh, in Germany. And we were happy to, to help provide that, uh, that milestone. Um, You've already heard about the process. I can keep that very short. Uh, we took the uh, indicators and built up a interdisciplinary team, which is also an important success factor. It doesn't work if there are only lawyers or only sociologists or only political science people. 
you have to get everybody involved, including people who know a lot about data and how to tease out the secrets from data. Um, we focus specifically on how uh, the internet uh, uh, protects human rights and how uh, human rights can be ensured through digitalization. Some of the central results uh, uh, focusing on the categories which you've um, uh, pointed us to. Um, Germany uh, is uh, one of those countries where the level of internet usage is high. It is uh, still growing, but it is already very high. There are, however, even uh, in a developed country like Germany, differences in usage between people who have jobs and who don't have jobs, people who are in formal employment and those who are not, between uh, people with a migration background and without one. We um, found that those gaps um, are uh, important enough to warrant a more a, a stronger uh, political response. Um, we've also found, importantly, that uh, the internet digitalization has arrived at the center of different political fields. Digitalization shapes politics in Germany. Um, I'll come to that at the end, but also already as a short preview. In our recommendations, we suggested that uh, digitalization should be mainstreamed into each and every policy area. Um, and now the new German government has decided not to create an individual uh, an individual ministry for digitalization, but rather to mainstream digitalization into each and every ministry's work. I'm not saying that it was only because of our recommendations, but at least this aspect uh, of, um, of political uh, uh, planning is very much in keeping with our recommendations. Um, we uh, have also focused in our study uh, on distilling the problems inherent in a multi-level system of governance uh, with European Union laws, German laws, national and federal, on the federal and the lender, uh, the country system, interacting and sometimes, um, sometimes, sometimes counter counteracting. We teased out uh, where um, we still see room for improvement, especially in the field of education. I'll come to that in a second. Um, the German, uh, our assessment um, pointed to a, a certain lack of data regarding exclusion, regarding digital violence, especially as it's amplified by platform design decisions. This is nothing peculiar to Germany, but it's something that also the an, a comprehensive analysis of, uh, for instance, digital violence and the uh, processes to fight it uh, suffer from. We're calling in our recommendations for more transparency and accountability by all stakeholders. Surprisingly, um, in terms of infrastructure, uh, Germany lags behind its own commitments. Uh, already during the last government, um, the, the last government committed to uh, substantially expanding broadband to all Germans. They didn't quite manage that. It's still on the on the board to do that. Um, teaching, especially during the Corona year, um, is now uh, full of, uh, of 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 commitments to increasing digital skills. But the uh, federated structure of uh, the, the, the German education system, which does leave room for experimentation, sometimes um, leads to, 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 to planning uh, problems. Regarding rights specifically, we have um, uh, we've shown that the German court systems have a strong commitment to the online often equivalent, equivalency of, of rights. We have a number, we've referred to a number of court cases, including highest highest court cases which have confirmed that online rights have to be protected, including by private companies. They can take down non-illegal content if it's in their terms of service, but they have to respect fundamental rights in doing so, and uh, the, uh, the courts enforce that duty. Um, access to the internet is a right for everyone. Uh, if uh, you are on a governmental subsistence, that subsistence has to ensure that you have enough money to be able to take part in the communicative space and you can't do that without internet access these days. Um, we are uh, recommending uh, more investment in the uh, quality of media education and digital literacy all the while keeping the federalized structure that opens up room for experimentation. We are also uh, we also point out to the success story of the self-regulatory youth media protection system. We're calling for more data on gender and diversity uh, issues, including gender and diversity mainstreaming. 
that uh, that encompasses the whole life cycle of digital politics and products such as artificial intelligence. Um, gender diversity mainstreaming has to happen already at the point of construction of the teams that select the input and training data, and of course also with regard to the training data. Uh, Germany has a, strong, a long history um, of uh, a, a strong uh, defense of democracy against anti-democratic statements. Uh, we have the uh, we have national laws against, uh, for instance, uh, Holocaust denial. Those were applied online too, through uh, the Network Enforcement Act, the NetzDG, which has become rather well known globally. This norm has been formed a couple of times, but still, digital violence is of concern and has led to radicalization and offline harm. We are underlining the state responsibility to bridge digital divide, not only within socioeconomic sectors, but also regarding the city countryside and employed unemployed dimension. And we're calling for more strong protection of AI based against AI based discrimination. Our um, report has been uh, published online. Uh, you can find it at uh, Wikis dem Internet DE, which translates to uh, and what about uh, how is the internet going? Uh, .de, and also at internet 2020de both in English and in German. That's a snapshot of our website, which the German UNESCO Commission. Uh, did a fantastic job in in in, in designing. Um, you can uh, search for specific um, uh, words such as uh, development, cyber criminality, e-government, IT security, multi-stakeholder community, and this will automatically give you all of the uh, indicators where that word appears. Because some of the issues, of course, are intersectional, and you uh, can then immediately find all of the topics uh, that you are looking for. Um, the, the site, as I've said, is well designed uh, with a good visual component. So it's also very well accessible to people with um, disabilities. We have done our very, very best to um, to to be present and to, to support UNESCO's attempt to, um, to to tell people about our experience. Uh, in the last couple of months, um, I've had the honor and privilege to present uh, our, our experience a couple of times. And um, I'm very willing to do so always again because it's such a pr pr privilege to um, talk a bit about the, the last year uh, and the, the reporting process. We've launched the whole thing uh, at the Internet Governance Forum in Germany when I still had a lot less hair but looked kind of sad as we see it on there. Um, and um, when we did that, it really made quite a quite a, a splash. Uh, the, the ZDF, Germany's biggest television, started its evening program with a reference to the uh, uh, to, to what UNESCO wants, of course, it's not quite what UNESCO wanted. You know, it's, it's rather a you know, a report conducted, you know, conducted uh, for the German UNESCO Commission suggested uh, more, a better, better internet connection. But you know, in today's media age, things get you know, abbreviated a bit, and you know, just writing there, UNESCO wants a right to a, a quicker internet, isn't completely false. We did say that you know, internet is important and rights are important, so you know, the words were there. Um, but this, as I've said, made quite a quite a splash, and all the media um, uh, some uh, re reference the the report. And I think that's an important thing because you know you have to get them to the report, and then they are stuck there and start reading what it's really about. So we were rather happy with that. And as I've said, a lot of the topics we've raised in our recommendations have made it into the coalition treaty, which has just been agreed to uh, last week for the period of twenty twenty one to twenty twenty six. Um, and we're very hopeful. Uh, that uh, that the the recommendations will therefore be um, make it make an impact. Thank you very much um, for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to any questions, uh, also by email. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Matthias. Like you are sending us a Christmas gift in advance. Uh, congratulations for such an excellent online um, platform using the uh, German IUI assessment. We should definitely link it to UNESCO website. Uh, and uh, that can be really good practice for other countries to also to, to try it out, uh, to share and impact uh, more uh, policymakers through this kind of uh, communication initiative. Um, now I'm introducing the next speaker um, representing the ongoing research of Romex in Ghana, um, Mr. Simon Kafu Aito. Are you there? 
Mr. Simon Kafui, are you there? If uh, you are not there, um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker representing the Romics assessment in Tunisia, uh, Mr. Kamo Rasgi. Are you with us? Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> hi, Kamo. Nice to see you on the screen. I am with you. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank excellent. You. Thank you very much. Yeah, please start your presentation on Tunisia. I, I share my presentation. Yes, please. And could you please promote uh, Kamel request to share his screen? Thank you. I think uh, you see my presentation. I see your name, but oh yeah, uh, it's a word document. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. it is a word uh, document. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your uh, invitation. So um, I will, uh, but to to respect the, the time, the the five minutes uh, uh, hard limit. I will uh, just uh, read my my uh, my contribution, and maybe after in the uh, the exchange session, I will uh, uh, precise uh, other uh, aspects. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so while the development of the national internet environment is rich in Tunisia due to the significant steps by uh, the government, private sector, independent regulators, civil society. A clear vision is still lacking from the government side due to the political instability over the last few years after uh, to, uh, 2011 political change. As such, there are a notable shortcoming in the process of developing and a consistent and coherent framework for the government in collaboration with other stakeholders. This leads to inequalities in the use and exploitation of the internet, especially for vulnerable populations such as people with uh, disabilities. Concerning uh, the human rights issues, uh, I, I could say that the Tunisian uh, political change of uh, 2011 have greatly shifted the rights landscape in Tunisia from a, a, rep a repressive regime that engaged in online censorship and widespread mass surveillance. The country now enjoys relative openness. Tunisia's internet environment is regulated by several sectoral regulation as well as the, the constitution of uh, 2014 which can be applied to uh, the, the online sphere. The constitution provides several guarantees, such as the right to freedom of, of expression, the right to access information, and the right to privacy. Tunisian law doesn't make explicit distinction between rights protected online and offline. Currently, this is no body of law that is tailored to the virtual wor uh, world in Tunisia. However, the Tunisian legislator took certain initiatives towards the, the adaptation of law on the electronic uh, context, that, such as the law of uh, 23 June uh, 2009, amending the law on copyrights, for example. Uh, freedom of expression in Tunisia is generally outlined by the constitution and the two hallmark laws the law on uh, the freedom of the press, printing and publishing, and uh, the law uh, on uh, the freedom of audiovisual communication. These two laws it's establish certain limitation, but that are, uh, that are consistent with international standard and the ICPR. In practice, this constitution and legislative text 
which guarantee uh, freedom of expression on the internet under these uh, conditions are generally observed. However, at certain times, it has been noted that public uh, authority, especially, don't accept freedom of expression on the internet, particularly on certain social networks. Moreover, there are no laws that limit access to information online. Indeed, freedom of expression is guaranteed by the Constitution. Additionally, Tunisia has been a member of the Open Government Partnership since uh, 2014. There are, however, a few challenges that persist, I think. The lack of a Constitution Court is another point of concern still unestablished after six long years of political delays, the court would be the ultimate arbiter of, uh, of violations of the constitution. The court will also be tasked with the, the revision and possible abrogation of formal laws that no longer conform to the constitution. The establishment of the Tunisian Technical Agency for Telecommunication in November uh, 2013, created to fight the, threat, uh, the threat of cyber crime and cyber terrorism, and mandated to exploit national monitoring systems of telecommunication traffic for purpose of providing technical support to the judicial inve investigation should be reviewed because of the debate about its status, missions, and prerogatives. Additionally, the law for uh, protection of personal data should be reformed to provide adequate safeguards and guarantees for personal data protection that conform with international human rights standards and that do not infringe on other fundamental uh, rights such as uh, the right to access information, which is an issue in the current ongoing bill. Finally, while the much loaded access to information law has been in place since March uh, 2016, the law remains incomprehensible uh, for much of civil society and the general public. More should be done to simplify the law's procedure in order to facilitate true access to public documentation. In addition, public and governmental documents should be provided online in access format, formats that allow for uh, reuse in open gov or open data projects for the improvement of social, environmental, and health related issues. Concerning the, the cross cutting issues, uh, we could say that uh, uh, while the internet acts as a new uh, frontier for business and so, uh, civil society, it also represents a space that is rife with harassment and potential abuse of users. Tunisia doesn't currently have a monitoring or reporting mechanism for the experience of users, especially for vulnerable groups such as children and women online data on the extent to which internet users report uh, harassment or abuse is available. Civil society groups and the Ministry of Women, uh, of Women currently offer services for users to report abuse online. And in some cases, certain non-profit organizations have intervened and worked with private companies to stop the abuse. In general, Tunisia has very strong laws pertaining to violence against women. In addition, in addition to physical violence, the law recognizes other forms of violence against women and girls, including economic, sexual, political, and psychological uh, uh, psychiatry one. However, it is uh, application in the online sphere remains difficult due to the inefficiencies within the judiciary and the lack of capacity in understanding and addressing online violence and abuse. So that is uh, the main uh, remarks uh, uh, in which we can, uh, we can uh, 
answer to uh, to the two uh, question uh thank you for your attention attention and uh, i will be uh, disposed to to the question and thoughts thank you very much thank you so much kamala for your very comprehensive presentation i also take this opportunity to pay tribute to our strongest partner in tunisia the entt the regulator of access to information law as you just mentioned who has been the strong partner we initiated the Romex assessment uh, in Tunisia and we do hope that uh, Kamel all of us can continue uh, this project uh, to I think it's uh, can be more valuable to help with a transitional society uh, like uh, Tunisia to achieve uh, good results of uh, digital transformation and now I'm uh, inviting the next speaker um, Maria Fernanda Martinez, uh, our newly initiated uh, Romex assessment in Argentina. Yes, hello, Changhon. I would like to present to. Yes, I can share. Yes. Yes, I think we can see your screen now. I think we are having the most active uh, presenters in at IGF. Every speaker are presenting, so I call upon our technical support to promote everyone to be a co-host. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Maria, I, will, I can see your screen very clearly. Um, Maria, I think you are unmuted. Could you turn on your microphone? <laughs> no, uh, no. Yes, now it's fine. No, it's fine when I would speak louder. Oh yeah, I hear you very clearly. Ah, okay. Well, uh, I'm saying that it is very interesting to share this experience with colleagues from all over the world. I'm going to start introducing myself. Um, my name is Fernanda Martinez. I'm the director uh, of the Center of Studies of Technology uh, at the University of San Andres in Argentina. It's a center for research, education, and dissemination on public policy and the development on digital process in Latin America. The member of the research teams are here. Um, the direction is in charge of Gonzalo Gustafrati. I'm the co-direction and the research team are Carolina Cairo, Ivan Kishman, Delfina Ferracuti, Gonzalo Gustafrati, Maria Fernanda Martinez, Juan Ortiz Freuler is the coordination and Carolina Guerra is the academic advising. Well, regards of findings in the category of human rights and cross country indicators. The protection of human rights in Argentina is guaranteed by the national constitution. Oh, don't worry. And although, I can, sorry, I have some problems here with my, I can, well, don't worry. Um, I was saying that Argentina is characterized by a long history of the civil society organization and promotion of human rights. About the equivalence principle, there is no specific rule in Argentina that recognizes the principle of online offline equivalence. Argentina adheres to the UN Human Rights Council resolutions stating that the rights of individuals must be protected on the internet. In practice, however, there is not always guarantee. Lack of adequate infrastructure and technical equipment to enable citizens to access quality internet, diverse level of digital literacy among the population. Laws that are not adapted to the specificities of the digital environment. For example, online crimes against women or girls. I don't know why I have so many trouble to share this. Ah. Um, Argentina has also a legal framework consistent with human rights and standards for the protection of women and children. However, there are some difficulties 
in guaranteeing the fulfillment of these rights online. Work is currently underway to incorporate the right category of digital violence and telematic violence. Argentina has also developed various actions to promote the equal inclusion of women, especially in the public sphere. However, this trend is not reflected with the same strength in the digital sphere. The trends of human rights violations that we find uh, doing this research, that here in Argentina we had problems with associated with migration, police abuse and the, the efficiencies in the security and prison policy, difficulties in exercising the rights of indigenous people, and the sustained increase in poverty and destitution, which mainly affect children aged zero to 14. On this, especially on digital environments, the implementation and expansion of the use of facial, rec facial recognition technology. We also have increasing cyber patrolling situations and increase of discriminatory expressions or harassment situation affecting mainly women. Well, COVID context reveal and in some cases deepened and pre-existing weaknesses. For example, we had some increases in complaints and cases of surveillance on networks by the security force. Although there increased the situation of intimidation and attacks on journalists, abusive implementation of restrictions on movement and forced confinement, increased restrictions on freedom of expression, existing inequalities in access to and use of the internet that mainly affect the most vulnerable population. Although we are still working on the recommendations, but we can't even identify the most outstanding ones. First, we recommend to advance consensus with all stakeholders to enable the design and implementation of long-term policies of internet issues. Second, to raise public awareness of the importance of protecting their rights online. Third, to generate awareness raising and training for government actors on these issues. And finally, to develop an active policy of collecting and analyzing disaggregate data on internet, especially in access, affordability and use. Well, thank you very much and sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> No, it went very smoothly. We get you perfectly. Thank you so much, uh, Fernanda, for sharing the uh, interim findings from Argentina assessment. We do look forward to a full completed assessment and the results from Argentina, perhaps in early next year. And also we look forward to more collaboration with you and your institute. Um, now I'm introducing the next speaker also from the same Latin America region. I have to say that uh, Latin America region has been very proactive to use the Yomex indicators to a national assessment uh, each year. At first one uh, from Brazil, now rolling to a number of countries in Latin America. So the next speaker is Mr. Eduardo uh, Carrillo, representing the Yomex assessment in Paraguay. Sir, are you there? Yes, yeah, I, I see you. Hi, Eduardo. Can you hear me well? You do, do want to? I couldn't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? You did? Um, but we couldn't hear you. Um, our magic uh, technicians, why I couldn't hear Eduardo? Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Now I can yes. hear you. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's an issue. Uh, microphone for some reason zoom doesn't like my computer <laughs> very well <laughs> um, well thank you very much Shanghom. I'm going to share my screen myself so just let me see if I can do that smoothly yes you will I'm asking our technician to allow you yeah now they did it instinctively thank you okay great um I already here so I going straight into the subject because uh, I know the time constraints um, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to discuss about the idea of Romex indicators and particularly to both Shanghon and Karen uh, for its continued support uh, in this work. 
So in regards to the Paraguayan context, uh, the research was conducted by the Ministry of ICTs of Paraguay and the local civil society organization, TEDIC, which I'm representing today. My name is Eduardo Carrillo and I'm co-director in this organization. Um, it was finalized in October of 2019, and it includes the 109 core indicators, the full indicators for the dimension of multi-stakeholder participation, and additionally two general indicators, namely those of open government partnership to showcase um, the progress of the country in the matter, much like the Tunisia uh, example that was just uh, showed a few minutes ago. Um, so just to have like a brief moment to talk about the methodology, much like some of the previous presentations in this panel, uh, an initial data collection combining desk-based research, freedom of access to information requests, consultation of official statistics, independent surveys, and reports, uh, consultation of reports of different credible sources such as academ academia and think tank actors here in Paraguay were conducted. And I think that what's interesting in the Paraguay context is that this data collection was uh, combined with three consultation and validation processes. We had a first moment of request for information and interviews with government departments, uh, private companies, technical community, academia and civil society organizations for an initial information validation that was then um, followed by the confirmation of the multi-stakeholder advisory board, which is of course the main uh, or a main aspect of the Romex um, methodology, which was composed by three representatives from the public sector, four representatives from civil society, two from the academic sector. And of course, this was the main body that peer reviewed and gave feedback uh, for the report before it was finalized. And then there was a final assessment and validation from the Paraguayan Internet Steering Committee, which is the main multi-stakeholder body uh, governance of the internet. Now, uh, due to time constraints, I will only do a general description of the main findings in the rights and cross-cutting issues, which is uh, this particular panel's uh, objective. So, uh, for the right section uh, in the findings and recommendations, I would say, uh, Paraguay has a robust human rights regulatory framework, such as the right to privacy, freedom of speech, uh, access to public information, and others. And what particularly stands out uh, for the Paraguayan context is the existing harmonization between the public international uh, rights norms and the human rights and the national constitution. Uh, although there is not an explicit normative that indicates that the same online rights are applied to the online environments, in practice, the judiciary system, as well as some public policies that emanate from the executive sector, do extend, uh, it, do extend such rights to the online environment as well. Now, for this particular section, uh, one of the main findings and recommendation is the need of a new personal data protection law for Paraguay. Uh, such law has to be treated with urgency in the legislative sector uh, because there is an important confusion as we speak with the law of credit related data, which is the one that is uh, enforced, because the protection of such rights are not enough for an analytic protection uh, of data, of personal data of people. Uh, so therefore, this law should be in line with other international uh, holistic and protective legislation, uh, such as examples from the European Union, particularly the GDPR. Uh, moving on to the um, cross-cutting issues, findings and recommendation, uh, I would say that there is and there was a particular difficulty that is transversal in this indicator, but also in all, all the others while the research was being conducted. Uh, and is the absence of evidence that is needed in order to build a more assertive policy uh, to meet current needs, uh, to, 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 to do a credible and effective diagnosis, which is why we think that the Romex is such an important uh, advance on this matter. But from this perspective, uh, data on online abuse and harassment are worrying, and there is still a lack of accountability from public institutions when it comes to proper data collection that could, could help measure the real and current impact of online violence towards women and children. Uh, in general, experts do recognize the existence of a Paraguayan legal framework to protect women against uh, violence and abuse. Um, however, there are still problems in its applicability because of structural problems with the judicial and public security systems and how they understand this issue, particularly when extended to the online world. 
Uh, regarding, regarding children, we have pretty much the same prob problem. There is uh, a need of a proper recollection of disaggregated data uh, by responsible institutions to overcome the lack of current data related particularly to the use and perception of children about internet and the ICT, and also the lack of disaggregated data more broadly on this particular matter. Um, in relation to sustainable development uh, and ethical and legal aspects, a lack of proper monitoring mechanism for projects related to the use of the internet and ICTs within the public sector has been identified as a challenge that needs to be tackled to follow the real degree of execution and progress of these projects by civil society and more broadly speaking citizens that are interested in the matter and to ensure a proper level of accountability in these kinds of projects. Um, Finally, I don't have a slide for that, but um, it was asked from us to talk a bit about the lessons learned uh, for the Paraguayan context uh, in the development of a Romex methodology. Uh, so I would say that first, the combination of different validation processes has been or has proved to be useful in terms of networking and in terms of ensuring that uh, different actors are aware of the conduction of the Romex indicator in a particular country, in this case, Paraguay. But of course, uh, sustaining the commitment of these ad hoc bodies uh, is also a difficult thing because everyone has different uh, commitments that needs to be addressed. So a sustained progress through time, and of course, being the Romex uh, research that takes a lot of time, there is a bit of a disconnection maybe from the initial moment where a particular body, both for peer review or validation is um, conform conformed, and then when they actually need to do the job. Uh, there might be some time gaps there, time gaps there that needs to be, um, let's say, taken into account by future teams that would like to do uh, validation processes from multiple sources, not only the multi-stakeholder advisory board. Um, and also I would say that in our particular case, the commitment uh, from government and particularly the MITIC office uh, in Paraguay to conduct the research is crucial in order to make sure that public institutions answer you and give you the necessary information uh, to fill the gaps in the different indicators. Um, so I would stay here. I think I was in the... <laughs> five minutes. Uh, and thank you very much again, Shang Hong, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for such a solid uh, presentation. Actually, we are ending this first uh, semantic session, unless if our speaker from uh, Ghana and Ethiopia, did they eventually connect in? Uh, if not yet, um, let me move to the second session, because we are quite behind the schedule. I will wrap up all the question answer in the end to allow for a full presentation from all your speakers, because I know every speaker representing one country's situation of research. We need more time. So now i like to introduce the second thematic session to share the key findings and recommendations in the Romex indicator, particularly on openness and accessibility indicators. The first speaker will be Professor Alan Kindu. Please come to, yeah, to, to here. Uh, Professor Kindu is a UNESCO chair based in University of Bogdo. He has been leading a number of national initiatives in Western Africa. So today he's going to present uh, Benin and Niger to Western countries assessment process. Um, I'm asking the technician, could you please um, project, uh, uh, sorry, it's not this one, it's the, the third one. This one will be the next, thank you. From Kindu. Can you pick your microphone? Yeah, I talk from here. Hello, uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je vais, um, OK, je vais parler. Euh, je vais parler en, en français, mais mon slide euh, est en anglais, donc ceux qui ne comprennent pas le français. 
pourront me suivre au fur et à mesure que je vais avancer dans cette présentation. Alors, comme on n'a que cinq minutes de présentation, je vais me focaliser sur l'expérience du Niger, qui est une expérience toute récente. Donc, c'est une étude que nous avons menée ensemble avec mon collègue ici présent, professeur Boubacar Diallo, que je remercie hein, d'avoir fait le déplacement euh, de, depuis le Niger, et donc avec aussi euh, l'appui euh, du ministère euh, de, des nouvelles technologies et de l'information qui est représenté euh, ici. Alors, euh, il y a eu pour cette étude une forte mobilisation également des acteurs de l'économie euh, numérique que, que je remercie. Ce qu'il faut savoir aussi, c'est que euh, le Niger est un pays euh, particulier euh, avec euh, d'énormes défis, euh, comme le défi de la pauvreté, le défi de l'analphabétisme, la question de la décertification, et puis vous connaissez aussi euh, cette insécurité que traverse le pays, sans compter les inégalités de genre. Mais euh, c'est aussi euh, un pays euh, où on va trouver une forte volonté, à la fois civile et politique, hein, de, de mettre le numérique au service des enjeux que, que je viens euh, de citer. Alors, donc, comme toutes les études, cette étude a été menée donc, avec l'appui d'un comité euh, consultatif qui est composé de l'ensemble des acteurs de l'économie du numérique. Et nous n'avons pas hésité d'ouvrir nos réunions à des personnes qui ne faisaient pas partie du comité consultatif. Et ça s'est avéré très positif, hein, puisqu'on a, euh, a été enrichi par ces personnes-là. Alors, donc, euh, et ce qu'il faut noter, c'est qu'en euh, termes d'ouverture, le, le Niger, c'est un pays qui est doté d'un cadre juridique adapté, hein. c'est le pays qui a, un pays qui a, a décidé d'actualiser sa politique numérique en prenant un certain nombre d'orientations, en tenant compte des grandes mutations technologiques. Donc, c'est dans ce cadre qu'intervient, par exemple, la stratégie Niger 2.0. Il y a également dans ce pays un cadre institutionnel qui est intéressant, constitué notamment du ministère que je viens de citer tout à l'heure, mais aussi d'un certain nombre d'autorités hein, comme l'ARCEP, des agences indépendantes de l'État ou euh, l'Agence nationale de la société de l'information qui est en phase avec les problématiques de l'universalité d'Internet. On a un certain nombre de lois qui permettent de suivre le développement du numérique, notamment la loi sur les transactions électroniques, la loi sur la, libère, la cybersécurité. Il y a effectivement, comme dans la plupart des pays africains, un certain nombre d'initiatives intéressantes dans le domaine du numérique, mais la grande difficulté, c'est d'arriver à trouver une dynamique générale, une dynamique économique. C'est pour cela que le pays a mis en place un certain nombre d'initiatives pour pouvoir accompagner notamment les start-up dans leur développement. Donc, cette volonté existe, cette politique existe, mais comme toute politique, il y a un certain nombre d'insuffisances et notre étude se devait de relever ces insuffisances-là afin de pouvoir faire un certain nombre de recommandations. Et donc, parmi ces petites faiblesses, on a constaté qu'il y a une insuffisance d'appui financier qui est apporté aux start-up. On a une quasi-inexistence de fonds d'appui aux acteurs du numérique. Et c'est euh, assez dommageable puisque la plupart des startups nigériennes ont des difficultés de développement qui sont liées à la difficulté, à, à la disponibilité financière. Hein. L'accès la, au crédit euh, n'est pas facile pour tout le monde. On a noté également que de nombreux efforts sont faits, euh, notamment dans euh, le domaine de, de l'accessibilité. La, mais malgré ces initiatives, notamment de mise en place d'espaces pour tout le monde pour pouvoir accéder au numérique dans, certaines, dans certains lieux de la, de, de la ville, euh, 
Les personnes à besoin spécifique, hein, plus précisément les personnes handicapées, considèrent qu'ils euh, sont en marge de l'inclusion euh, euh, numérique. Donc, en gros, il n'y a pas véritablement de politique d'accompagnement pour que ces personnes puissent accéder, accéder à, au, au, au numérique. Alors, on peut évoquer aussi dans le domaine de l'ouverture un certain nombre de dispositifs qui ont été mis en place, notamment la transparence des, euh, des, des marchés publics. Là aussi, le dispositif existe, mais dans, comme dans tous les pays, généralement, il y a un écart entre la mise en place de dispositifs législatifs et euh, la, la, la pratique qui s'en suit. Euh, les logiciels libres euh, ne font pas partie, ne font pas l'objet d'une politique spécifique. Euh, les données produites avec euh, l'argent public sont généralement euh, disponibles pour tout le monde, mais la difficulté, c'est qu'on est dans un pays où on produit très peu, en tout cas euh, pas beaucoup de données euh, scientifiques et il euh, y a des difficultés aussi, euh, notamment. Euh, au niveau euh, de, 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 du gouvernement, de mettre en place euh, des plateformes hein, qui sont actualisées pour que les gens puissent accéder euh, à ces données-là. Les sites Internet existent, les compétences existent, mais je crois qu'il n'y a pas suffisamment de compétences pour pouvoir mettre en place ces données euh, actualisées, pour pouvoir les actualiser euh, souvent. Alors, je vais essayer de faire vite, puisque le temps nous est compté. Alors, euh... Dans le domaine d'accessibilité, de l'accessibilité, je pense que, comme je viens de le dire, on essaie de faire en sorte que le pays puisse accéder donc au numérique et on essaie d'offrir des prix qui sont concurrentiels. On observe notamment euh, une certaine hausse du taux de pénétration d'Internet. Mais euh, toutefois, il faut savoir qu'on part euh, d'un taux qui est très faible. Hein, les, donc, les efforts existent, mais il va falloir continuer à, à faire ces, ces, ces efforts-là, puisque selon l'Union internationale des télécommunications, euh, aujourd'hui, 10, 10 habitants pour 100 disposent d'un accès à Internet au Niger. Donc, en gros, la marche de progression euh, est, est très importante. Euh, il y a également euh, des contraintes qui ont été soulevées, notamment sur, euh, par rapport au coût euh, de l'Internet dans le, dans, dans le pays. Euh, C'est un pays dans lequel la majorité de la population vit avec moins de 2 dollars par jour. Donc, le coût est un problème euh, important. Ainsi, donc, nous avons fait un certain nombre de recommandations en termes d'accessibilité euh, au gouvernement et ces recommandations euh, sont, concernent notamment la nécessité de contraindre les fournisseurs de services d'Internet à proposer des offres qui sont compatible avec l'état des personnes en situation de handicap. J'ai évoqué tout à l'heure cette question importante et on pense que le gouvernement a des efforts à faire là-dessus, mais on doit contraindre aussi les, les opérateurs et les professionnels à pouvoir prendre en charge cette, cette situation-là. Euh, il est également important de mettre en place euh, un dispositif d'accompagnement des universités et des étudiants pour pouvoir accéder à Internet. L'initiative est déjà en cours parce que là, il y a l'Agence nationale de la société de l'information qui est engagée dans cette direction et nous ne pouvons qu'encourager que cette initiative se prolonge. Il faut également euh, s'attaquer à la question de la cybercriminalité hein, parce qu'on est dans une zone qui est très, qui est très sensible, mais au-delà de la sécurité, des questions de sécurité, il y a aussi à prendre en compte cette question de la protection de l'enfant, la question de la protection des femmes hein, qui sont de plus en plus mises en cause par rapport sur, sur, le, sur le numérique. Voilà, en gros, euh, je pense que je viens de dépasser mes, mes cinq minutes. Hein. Voilà en gros ce qu'il convient de, de dire euh, par rapport euh, au Niger, qui a été une expérience très, très intéressante. Euh, là, je viens de survoler un petit peu les recommandations. Il y en a encore beaucoup plus. Donc, je vous invite à lire tout simplement le document qui sera publié euh, très bientôt. Merci.
Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for preparing such a bilingual uh, a presentation. I also like to thank uh, my colleague in Paris, Karen. Uh, she has been uh, simultaneously translating to English in the chat uh, in the Zoom. And also we have a, a good colleague, uh, Stephen, to be the uh, rapporteur for this session to take notes to prepare the documentation. We are going to link all this uh, written contribution PPT to the website uh, on UNESCO following session so everyone can really access them to have a full uh, information after the session. Now I'm asking as uh, the next speaker, Mona Shataya, representing the Yongmix assessment in Palestine. Mona, thank you. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thanks for having us and for organizing the, se the session. So this is Mona Shtaya, the Advocacy Advisor of Hamla, the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. We've started working on uh, the Rome X since the last year, but obviously we are going to launch that earlier hopefully earlier the next year. Uh, till now, we are still preparing that, so we are under process. Uh, but I'll be sharing like uh, the, um, the insights that till now we are collecting. And uh, then if you have any questions, just feel free to drop that. So I'll start with the different context in Palestine that we have because Palestinians in the Palestinian territory are living like uh, under a complex political situation because of the Israeli occupation, but also because of uh, the political split between the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And because of that, or as a result of that, we have three different governments that affecting or impacting the digital rights in Palestine and also the internet reality in Palestine, the PA in West Bank, the, the de facto government in Gaza Strip, but also the Israeli authorities in Israel who are also affecting the reality in the Palestinian territory. Uh, to start with, I'll start with the uh, infrastructure, which is something fundamental when we are talking about the internet reality in Palestine, the Palestinian authority or the Palestinian, yeah, the Palestinian authority are not controlling the infrastructure in Palestine, all the ICT telecommunication infrastructure is being controlled by the Israeli uh, authority. And because of that, this will affect the, uh, the um, uh, quality of the internet that we have in Palestine. So now Palestinians in the West Bank are, are using the 3G. They don't even get the 4G or the 5G, while the Palestinians in Gaza Strip are still having the 2G, the second generation of the internet, because also that we, we are not controlling our infrastructure. Going further and discussing much more details about the internet reality in Palestine, we should think about uh, as part of the Rome X uh, indicators, the privacy data protection, access to information law, but also uh, how the internet and the uh, access to uh, websites is looking like. And because of that, I'll start with the cyber crime law that we have, uh, the Palestinian Authority had started legis legislation, legislating that in 2017, and they adapted that in 2018, with the pressure from the civil society organizations, local and international organizations. And because of that, till now, we sometimes have uh, some restrictions from the PA because they are blocking specific websites. Uh, last year, for example, they blocked uh, at one day um, around 55 uh, websites because they were opponent to the, uh, to the uh, PA. But also, uh, they, they have some other restrictions in, in that law that restricting uh, people's accessibility to specific uh, websites. On the other hand, in Palestine, till now, we don't have the access to information law. UNESCO has been like one of the longest organizations who've been advocating for that, also as well as Hamle and other Palestinian uh, human rights and media organizations. We've been advocating to have the access to information law for since 2006. The government was working on that until now. They, they did not like uh, publish it or, or announce about anything about that. And because of that, this was one of the restrictions while we were collecting the data and information for our report because we don't have the access to information law and this definitely will uh, impact the uh, Rome X um, indicators that we are collecting to now and we are analyzing. On the other hand, on the privacy and data protection, Side in Palestine till now we don't have any kind of privacy and data protection law, and that 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 also uh, is is affecting Palestinians' right in 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 the internet. Um, 
we at Hamley have also published a separate uh, report talking about privacy and data protection earlier this year, uh, which shows during the, the launching event, we knew that or we just were informed that the PA were discussing to launch a privacy and data protection law, despite the fact that they have never ever consulted the civil society or any other one except the governmental bodies. And because of that, we are trying during our preparation process for, for our Romex to engage through the multi-stakeholders advisory board, different people from the private, governmental, civil society, and media organizations, so we can have all, all, all their inputs, as my, as my colleagues previously talked about their countries, but also we have this thing in Palestine. Of if we are like moving about to talk about misinformation and disinformation, we have also this kind of thing in Palestine. And in an earlier report we published last year in Hamle, we saw that there is um, uh, Palestinians are affected uh, by the misinformation and the disinformation because uh, because of many things like the political split and also have having the uh, occupation in the Palestinian territory and this has also been included in our uh, uh, indicators that we are still uh, preparing till now and because of that uh, we have like multi um, uh, multi um, tools like uh, that are affecting the Rome X results that we are preparing. We are looking forward to have our Rome X ready by the end of this year and hopefully sharing that by the beginning of the uh, next year. But also when we are talking about the, uh, the, the Rome X, we cannot ignore the as my pr previous colleagues uh, said, the gender-based violence and how the gendered and the internet and is like having this intersectional thing in Palestine, women like there are increasing number for women who are being harassed on the internet, and because of that, they sometimes are reporting to the police, but also sometimes they are reporting to the uh, feminist organizations. Uh, we at Hamle have also monitored and documented that where one of one out of three Palestinian women have been experienced the harassment on the online spaces, and one out of three women were leaving the internet because they they have been harassed on the network. Uh, so all this information are being included in our Romex and many other uh, indicators, many other information. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically from, uh, from our side. But also if you have any questions, please feel free to drop that in, in the chat box. I don't want to take more time just to leave some time for the other colleagues to share their insights. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mona, for your very valuable sharing of insights. We do look forward to the successful completion of the assessment in Palestine. And now I'm introducing uh, Simon Ellis, our expert leading the assessment in Thailand, and also uh, he's our international advisor to have help reviewed a number of national assessment reports. Um, Simon, I think uh, you have a PPT, and um, sir, could you please project? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to go as quickly as possible, very short of time. Okay, um, so thank you, Shen Hong. Thank you to everybody. Um, there's already been a lot of very rich presentations of a, a, an enormous amount of detail about so many countries. Um, so what I want to do is to, to first pick up on a few uh, emerging issues that come across quite a lot of the studies, this, which are, uh, are from all regions now in IUI. So firstly, um, there are many countries now which have rights adopted, but there are questions emerging about whether they're actually implemented in practice. So uh, one of the things that IUI does, it, it looks at the institutional legal structures, but it also looks about how that happens in practice. Um, it's difficult for countries because we know that um, there is the right to freedom of speech, but we know that, that there are also reasons that all of us want uh, hate speech, misogyny, fake news, child abuse to be taken down. So governments often are not sure how to balance this, uh, uh, what to take down and what not to take down. 
um, uh, and especially governments which are not used to legislating on the internet, this can be a, a, a major issue. Um, the other thing is, which we'll come back to several times, is disadvantaged groups. We've talked about women, we talk about remote um, people, um, people who are uh, um, difficulties of uh, poor, of, of access to the internet. Uh, and again, I think one of the things here is that app, apps increasingly need to meet their needs. Apps are often designed to meet the needs of people in big cities. Um, they should be more to do with rural things. Um, and for example, in Thailand, there's a lot of apps being developed for remote management of farms of the younger generation in Bangkok seeking to help. Um, data protection has come up a lot. And in this context, the European GDPR is taken as a standard. But once again, that's being applied in many countries without countries really realizing exactly what the GDPR means in its detail of uh, protection um, in, in various ways. And then another thing that emerges to me is a question as to whether we are seeing regional patterns in the internet uh, emerge. So um, uh, Africa has been a leader in developing mobile money um, for phone systems and so on. Uh, whereas in Asia, uh, electronic payments are now universal. Um, and by contrast, for example, as uh, uh, somebody read recently, of course, it's only three or four years since America stopped having to sign for all credit card payments. So things are not always, uh, things are going in different directions. Um, and apps, with things which work or, or important are useful in one region may not be important in the other. Um, so this is picking up a gun on the rights, balancing rights of internauts versus an expression versus uh, hate and misogyny. Um, uh, where the, I think, again, we should be supporting here uh, the, the media transparency report by companies, which, which have been kind of lost out of the attention in recent years. And, and companies have sort of started to um, move back on them and, and, and publish them in more remote locations, let's say. Um, whereas I think actually we should be calling for these to be more strengthened, um, especially in countries where um, the government is, is not really taking that forward. Access and, and use. Um, I think this is really important, this first point. Access seem is simply, you know, can you connect? But having connected, can you use it for anything? And sometimes the disadvantaged groups, the people who are not using the internet, the thing they report is that they don't see the point in it. And, and why would anybody not see the point of the internet? The reason is because there's nothing on the internet which meets their needs. You know, where are the apps designed, as I say, for agricultural management, for um, finding uh, 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 problems, everyday problems of just basic health and education and, and jobs? Um, let me go on. Okay. Uh, and the multi-stakeholder um, aspect is also extremely important. So we are in a multi-stakeholder environment. The IGF's basis is this multi-stakeholder bringing together everybody to discuss this. What IUI does is cements that in a national context. It asks in countries whether all these different parties that we find here today um, and online as well are able to have a say in um, working through the internet and the developing it for the particular countries concerned. Um, I think also that the other, another important here is internet studies often divide between the kind of technical telecom side and then the social human rights side. Um, and IUI can cut across that. And two examples that I've seen here is um, a number of countries have this use of TV white space. So, TV companies are, are allocated certain spectra for broadcasting, but they don't use it that often. And it's been proved that in local communities, that spectrum can be used without damaging or, or interfering with TV signals at all. So that sense of, of using TV white space for local networks is important. Another one vis-a-vis -vis this whole idea of uh, webs and takedowns and so on, is there actually is this error code which should, be up, should go up when you can't access a web, web page. 
technically error 451 means the page is not available for legal reasons. And as I've said, this could be good reasons or bad reasons, but the fact that that's a technical thing, it should be up on the web and therefore you can count it, you can see why um, this site has been taken down and you can at least have some sense as to where to go to if you feel that um, it should not have been. And going forward. Maybe I'm not pointing in the right direction. Next, please. Thank you. Um, again, I've talked about this a little bit, regionalization of the internet. And for Asian platforms, um, Line is one of the big Asian platforms for social exchange um, com compared to Europe and North America where Facebook is completely dominant. Um, um, and then there's a, a mixed level of development. I've talked about urban, rural, um, but, but also there's a sense of, um, it's, it's not just, it's partly in, in developing countries, it can be money, but it can be relevance of apps. So um, the, the, the inter digital divide is not simply about getting phones into people's hands. It's also now the more countries do develop the internet, the more the problems are in more and more particular groups whose needs must be uh, um, um, promoted, recognized. So finally, I'm, I'm coming on to Thailand, which I guess I will just kind of develop some of or specify the uh, uh, answer here. We've heard this uh, um, before. And um, what the IUI reports need to do is to, is to incorporate evidence from all sides. So one of the thing here is uh, um, key interviews, interviews with all sectors, let the business people have their say, um, let civil society have their say, um, and, uh, and the telecoms uh, industry, um, uh, ICT industry, government agencies, so that you can have all the views expressed all together. And, and David Suter has um, emphasized this right from the start. Next, please. Um, similarly, um, uh, several people have also uh, uh, um, uh, talked about this idea of triangula triangulation, bringing in different evidence from different sides, secondary literature, um, UNESCO expertise, uh, it needs to be come from the country, it needs to be embedded in the country, but UNESCO is there to lean on, as it were, and to point in the right direction or put you in touch with the right people, and then integrating that all together. Next, please. Um, so we, we see this sense of the parallels of human rights in the physical and the digital world. We all know that's the basis of the way things should carry on. Um, and it's also something that people generally understand and, and it, it is um, important. There's the balancing of freedom of expression and abuse. Again, um, this point that countries are taking on, developing countries are taking on laws from more developed countries um, and not seeing either how they apply or, or not seeing how they must be implemented. Um, and emerging right for information issues, which is in the SDGs. And the leak to the sustainable development goals is another big to, um, thing to push on and which can help uh, um, uh, inform policy development and implementation. Um, I've talked a little bit about disadvantaged communities. Technology to impact. Um, again, this is a sense of how IUI can take the technology and the, the very technical telecom side and push it forward to what that actually means in society. Um, so the innovative tech not pilots are often not followed up. So, for example, in Thailand, there was an open hospital management system developed in the early 2000s, which was very successful and adopted in various countries. And nowadays would be fantastic, but has, has disappeared. I've talked about TV, TV white space. I've talked about remote management of farms. Lastly, again, something which is more of a regional or developing country, e-waste. So Southeast Asia has a particular thing of dumping of e-waste in uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. And this is David Suter mentioned right at the start. It's not just the core indicators here. E-waste is not a core indicator in IUI, but it's extremely important for Southeast Asia. Um, and it, it's important that this is recognized, uh, that, um, that the results, that the huge discarding of all this tech which we're seeing should not be dumped on uh, certain countries. 
So um, for me, IUI is an emerging standard. It's, a, it's an international standard, but a standard that is coming bottom up. Although there are all these indicators, there are, there are these principles which are beginning to emerge as core issues, which are linking the technical and the social, and linking what happens in government to what happens in civil society, which mirrors the way that um, things, uh, institutions like Internet Governance Forum work. And the more countries that join in on this, and now um, we really have a, a large number of car countries moving forward and a large number of countries to turn to, the stronger the arguments are going to be to support some of the, this work and the stronger the arguments are going to be to suggest that some countries should move in certain directions. Um, um, so that is really the conclusion for me from all of this, that we have an emerging standard, but it's an emerging standard that's built bottom up and it's built by the people you've heard today in the countries that have been speaking today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for not only sharing the Thai report, but also really your global insights on the romics. And also I appreciate your high expectation on the potential for IUI to be an emerging standard. Now I'm looking uh, to my agenda where I'm having the last speaker for this semantic session, Mr. Santosh Sitigal, representing the Romex assessment in Nepal. So Santosh, are you with us? If not, I'm very uh, happy to say that uh, today, uh, for the first two semantic sessions, uh, we have a very high percentage of success of accessing that uh, personal link to this session because we have uh, 12 speakers invited. Now we have three speakers who had uh, difficulties. So it's still, we are lucky to have most of majority of speakers with us. Um, now I think we have five minutes before we can move to the next session. Uh, I would like to suggest that uh, we relax a little bit, uh, although it's not a break, uh, uh, but I'd like to ask the colleagues in the room if you have any quick reaction and questions to exchange with our presenters, particularly on the human rights and the openness and accessibility indicator um, fundings just presented, or if you have any other general uh, questions, comments, please uh, don't be shy and uh, take the floor. There's a microphone uh, in the room and uh, I trust um, um, our speakers online also like to hear uh, some voice from the room. And now floor is yours. We have uh, three to four minutes. Yes, please, sir. Please go to the microphone and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm from a Francophone country, but I will speak in English. Um, I would like to uh, thank very much uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Kiyindu, with who we have uh, realized the study of uh, Niger. Um, what is uh, important in these uh, studies is that uh, my country has a very interesting technical uh, infrastructure and uh, the, the system of uh, law uh, has worked uh, very hard to deal with uh, some aspect of uh, the human rights, some aspect of uh, the accessibility, some aspect of uh, uh, the uh, cross cutting uses. Uh, what do we uh, get from the study is uh, that uh, the country didn't have a digital code. And uh, uh, we have many data which uh, lack. And uh, from the recommendation, uh, Niger can uh, uh, do a very good job because uh, when we will finish the process of the uh, the report, we will come back to uh, try to prove, uh, to, to find uh, responses to all the data which uh, lack in the study. Uh, also, I will, I want to uh, thank very much uh, UNESCO for this very, very good job, uh, which showed that uh, really you work for the humanity. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to congratulate you for this very good job. Thank you. Thank you for your very kind words and support. 
Anyone else? We have another minute. Yes, please, sir, take the floor. Introduce yourself first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kosi from Benin. The statement is a good thing. May now, after the statement, what is the next step? UNESCO have something like support money to help the countries to make the recommendation be realist. Is it possible to have some other organization like UNESCO, ITU, uh, Global IGF, also if it's possible, or uh, UN, to support the countries getting money to let them make the recommendation very useful for the people inside. Is it possible to have something like that? Uh, thank you for this very valid question. I take the opportunity of the presence of UNESCO director in charge of the Partnership Operational Program Monitoring, Madame Mariosa Oliveira. I think she will be in a very good position to respond to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very good point. Um, UNESCO is supporting uh, the development of, uh, of uh, several of the reports, uh, the IUI reports uh, themselves, you know, the creation of these reports and the analysis, the data collection and analysis uh, that results in the recommendations. And uh, there are opportunities in UNESCO itself also for uh, um, seeking support for implementation of recommendations. UNESCO has a series of programs such as the Information for All program, uh, the uh, International Program on the Development of Communications, there may offer um, um, conditions and opportunities for um, you know, uh, specific areas of the recommendations to be implemented. We can also help support countries to seek you know, uh, other uh, sources of funding uh, in, uh, in the implementation of specific areas of these recommendations. And I think that that's, uh, that's one area in which we would like to also evolve you know the kind of support uh, uh, and uh, and collaboration that uh, exists out of uh, of the IUIs. You know, so thank you for that. Thank you, Director, for your strong support. Yes, UNESCO is mobilizing all kinds of financing, and uh, we are fundraising globally and regionally and nationally to support all the uh, national assessment and not only the research but also the follow up action to realize those recommendations into action as we have heard so many burning challenges. We are more than ready committed to providing all kinds of financial support as well as the technical support to ensure all the assessment ongoing and uh, to come will be in high quality, will be eventually have an impact. Um, thank you for all your engagement. And uh, now I'd like to um, start the following session on the category of multi-stakeholder indicators. Um, we are having five speakers in line. Um, I'd like to introduce the first speaker to present actually the first completed the Yomex assessment in Brazil, Mr. Alexander Barbosa, our, our sir of the Rome. Hi, <laughs> Alexander. Um, yeah, okay. I can see you smile. Yeah, please share with us that uh, we all know Brazil is a leader, is a hero of uh, uh, of practicing multi-stakeholder approach on internet governance, and you have completed the first um, Romex assessment in the in the in the country. Please share your insights on the achievement and also uh, recommendations in this area. Uh, Alexander, please take the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Shen Hong. It's a great pleasure to be here. And congratulations for organizing this uh, very important event on the implementation and results and then findings on the internet universality indicators. Uh, I would like first to, to say that I really enjoyed Simon's uh, presentation. And I have to say that I fully agree with, uh, with him when he highlights the Brom as a standard um, and, uh, you know, we are fun of uh, Romex uh, framework, 
And uh, I think that we have to take this uh, statement from Simons and really support countries in the implementation of this uh, very important uh, tool. Well, I I'm not going to use uh, any slides, Shan Hong, because uh, just to be uh, within the time frame that I have. And before you mentioned that um, the Brazil is a really um, a country in which uh, multi stakeholderism is really working for internet governance. So uh, before highlighting some key findings and recommendations in the category of multi stakeholder, I'd like to recall that the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI.br, you probably have heard, have heard about it. Um, this is the multi stakeholder body for internet governance in the country. And it was really fundamental in the implementation of Romax indicators in the country. CGI uh, is composed of, uh, co composed of uh, 21 members from federal government, the private sector, uh, the civil society organizations uh, sector, and the academic and scientific community. So we have the whole voices, uh, different voices of society giving um, their inputs for the internet governance in the country. And among uh, CGI's uh, responsibilities are uh, is strategic uh, guidelines uh, related to the use and development of internet in Brazil. And it is very important to mention that in the implementation of the um, IUI indicators, we use it, this structured as the multi stakeholder advisory bo uh, board, the, the map as uh, it is recommended in the UNESCO guideline. So um, I would like to say as well that the um, internet universality indicators, uh, they did allow us to, to have a holistic view of the country's internet ecosystems. And although the country has advanced in building solid legal framework for internet use, the country still faces, I would say, a um, few challenges in terms of universal access, in particular to, mo to the most vulnerable um, uh, part of the population. Uh, and I would say that uh, we also have a challenge in, in promoting more advanced digital skills uh, development. Regarding uh, the point that you mentioned, uh, the findings and recommendations in the multi-stakeholder dimension. Let me say that regulation of internet development in Brazil is uh, regulated by different laws and standards. In addition, of course, to the general principles established by federal constitution that can be applied to the internet environment, such as, the private, such, such as uh, privacy, freedom of expression, and right to information. And the main governing uh, internet development in, uh, in Brazil is the Brazilian civil uh, rights framework for the internet, which is considered to be consistent with international standards and other existing references. Uh, this framework aims to promote global free flow of information, to promote open and interconnected nature of uh, internet, um, and to encourage multi stakeholder cooperation in policy development process. And last but not least, to ensure transparency and accountability and to strengthen neutrality, privacy, and data protection. So uh, the Brazilian report refers to a set of key recommendations for actions. And we uh, divided these recommendations by stakeholder group like government, civil society, private sector, academia, et cetera. And since I don't have much time, I will just highlight some of them for the uh, M dimension of the Romax framework. So uh, I would say that the two uh, group of actors really very important here are governments and uh, private sector. So for the government, I will just give you three examples. One recommendation is related to the need of strengthening the instruments for online participation and consultation on topics of social interest in our institutional bodies at all levels of government. We have a tradition to conduct public recommendations, but this is a very specific one 
for online participation uh, in the topics of social interest uh, related to internet and digital um, uh, online environment. Another recommendation is to extend and accelerate the, the, the digitalization of public services and strengthen the application um, of the access to information law in now public agencies of our units in the Federation, overseeing compliance comprehensively at the federal level and promoting enforcement at the state and municipal level. This is important. Many of the data collections that we did um, besides the primary and secondary data, we also um, asked government uh, through, this, um, uh, through this access to information law, we required uh, very important information to be included in our report. And last but not least, record and publish gov government submissions to international forums uh, concerned with ICT and the internet, such as uh, the IGF. So we are ask, recommending them to make public all the government publications and submissions to these international forums. And uh, regarding the, um, the private sector and the technical community, I will highlight just the need of um, having a more uh, deepen and strengthen existing initiative for promoting and combating human rights violation on the internet, particular, particularly abuses committed against children, women, and promote a culture of peace and respect in the online environments. So, Shan Hong, with that, um, I will stay only with these key recommendations. I would have more to say, but uh, I will leave my colleagues to also um, share their views on the M dimension of the Romex. Thank you so much, and once again, congratulations. Thank you, Alexandra. I equally enjoy your presentation, always so insightful. I trust that the good practice of CGI.br uh, will be really very useful for food for thought for other countries as well. Uh, actually, I remind that uh, we had, uh, UNESCO has published a publication on the good practice of multi-stakeholder approach a few years ago, both the Brazil and also Kenya uh, are out of uh, among the good practice in it. That's why I'm happy to introduce the second speaker, uh, Grace Jitanga, representing the Kicknet of Kenya to present um, the findings of M indicators in Kenya and also share good practice and lessons learned. I just wonder if Grace is with us today. I am here. Uh, I am here. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh <laughs> Grace, I cannot see you. Uh, wait, I'm trying to just just hang on. But Grace, you can you are, hear me, right? Yeah, yes. So you are not uh, in Katowice with us. No, 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 no. Oh. I am joining from Nairobi. Okay. Let me see my camera. Hold on, hang on. Yeah, I see you perfectly. Yeah. Please. All see. right. Yeah. So um, in Kenya, we were able to, to assess all the 109 core indicators. And uh, that was in 2019. And then we presented um, the report in 2020. I am happy to say that we will be reviewing, you know, the two year the two year period uh, in um, that is 2022. 20, so we'll be focusing on the two year review and looking at Kenya's ICT uh, environment. And so we, we actually did focus on all the, on, 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 on the ROM plus X. And um, I want then to just speak about the, the multi-stakeholderism and what we found. Now in Kenya, um, the aspect of uh, multi-stakeholderism is actually um, uh, entrenched in our constitution, Article 10 of our constitution that places a constitutional requirement on anyone who is uh, making ICT um, to involve the stakeholders. 
and, and, and therefore uh, bodies that uh, make ICT laws and policies have actually, uh, do have a requirement for this. However, such bodies like the regulator, the communications authority has actually always had a public uh, consultation even before the constitutional requirement. Um, and so when we come to multi-stakeholderism, you know, uh, Kenya was among the first countries that uh, held a national internet governance forum. And uh, in that, it actually embraced multi-stakeholderism. And that has continued up to today where we have various, uh, you know, various stakeholders coming together, industry stakeholders to organize the Kenya IGF. Of course, uh, Kiktanet, that's the Kenya ICT Action Network convenes. And then that multi-stakeholderism is seen in terms of participants, in terms of the topics that are discussed, in terms of uh, even um, the funding and the resources that are contributed. So we have that multi-stakeholderism in nature. So in terms of the report that we did, um, I want to start by saying that multi-stakeholderism then in ICT policymaking seeks to bring together diverse groups such as the government, the industry, the technical expert and civil society to engage. And this is in the design and implementation of policy standards. So the concept underpinning uh, this model is that all actors that make a significant contribution to the digital governance system should participate in a consensus decision uh, representing a collection of agreed viewpoints rather than a single source of confirmation and thus gain uh, legitimacy. However, sometimes efforts to build a meaningful, inclusive, uh, multi-stakeholder approach have been undermined uh, by mistrust among stakeholders. And this has seen instances where some stakeholders have been excluded in some policymaking processes or their positions not being reflected in the final outcome, uh, in the final outcomes. And so, um, you know, then we, 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 we for, you know, for instance, we have uh, the ICT committees of the National Assembly um, and the Senate, as well as the, 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 the communications authority who have called uh, for public participation on different laws at different uh, stages. And uh, sometimes there has been a very low engagement of ordinary citizens, um, which, is, which has been um, uh, associated with the lack of understanding on how ICT policy processes relate to them or have, um, you know, have a contribution in their lives. And therefore, uh, most of them have missed sometimes the big announcements, but also some of these big announcements have been put, <coughs> have been put in daily newspapers and um, there, there, there are few people now who buy uh, the newspapers. And so, you know, as, as, as the processes continue, there's need to actually look at platforms that ordinary, uh, ordinary people can actually get to know and participate and engage with the, with the policy making processes. And so some of the recommendations that we made on multi-stakeholderism, I will just highlight those of the government and civil society, uh, but we did make um, recommendations for the public, uh, for the private sector, for, the, for academia, for, for the technical community, and even for, for, for media and for ordinary, uh, citizens. So for governments, uh, what we said is that there is need to enact uh, public participation legis legislation, even as, is, as Article 10 of the Constitution provides for public participation, we need an attendant law that then outlines how this, uh, you know, uh, that guides public participation process. So we, we, we recommended for a framework that should provide for avenues for thresholds, for timelines and formats, uh, for citizen engagement while ensuring access to draft bills and, and also reporting uh, back mechanisms and structures that then are, are very clear and you know, 
outline if 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 your your recommendation has not been taken what are the reasons for example does it go against the constitution does it offend public morality why was it not taken on board and then create a public participation authority uh, to enforce public participation between agencies and make decisions uh, and the public and match public participation uh, tools uh, to objectives. We also recommended the need to facilitate citizen engagement with parliament and with county assemblies through uh, alternative media, including radio and mobile phones. Uh, we did recommend the need to adopt open source platforms to enhance internal uh, parliamentary and county assembly communication and also facilitate information sharing with the public. Again, it's necessary to provide access to weekly uh, Senate, National Assembly, County Assembly, Plenary and community uh, proceedings uh, by leveraging on both traditional and new media. And then of course, there's need to promote a multi-stakeholder participation by having an open door policy on policy formulation processes on internet governance discussions at national and county levels. Um, we also supported the encouragement of multi-stakeholder participation in policy making in all ICT issues and the need to have multi-stakeholder delegations comprising the government, the industry, technical experts, and civil society to treaty making uh, uh, conferences. And then of course, uh, support county, you know, we have smaller county governments, uh, possibly through the universal service fund to interpret policies to look in, in, you know, in, in local dialects and conduct public participation in the same to get people's views. So for civil society, we did recommend that there's need to conduct a research and document data on all multi-stakeholder engagement um, to track participation and monitor inclusion, diversity, and stakeholder representation. And we actually looked at the need that uh, the fact that we documented this, this UNESCO, UNESCO study is really groundbreaking because it has all the information at one stop and it allows for an assessment uh, that is all around or in the different uh, areas uh, of participation where ICT policy making processes uh, you know, are concerned. And then again, you know, they need to engage, civil society need to engage the national and county governments in ICT policy uh, initiatives, as well as find ways to collaborate uh, or utilize the existing policy structures and processes to foster good governance. Um, there's also the need to hold the government uh, accountable uh, to transparent and open multi-stakeholder participation in international policy making processes, as well as advocate for balanced and inclusive stakeholder representation at national, regional and international internet governance forums. And finally, uh, foster more inclusive participation on internet governance issues from underrepresented groups, such as women, uh, person with disabilities, and marginalized uh, com communities. And of course, uh, one recommendation to individual users, which we, uh, you know, working in internet governance need to ensure that individual stakeholders continue to understand is the need, uh, you know, how do we uh, make them cultivate interest and endeavor to participate in awareness creation programs on internet governance and the meaning of stakeholderism so that they also understand they have a stake in these processes and they need to contribute and they need to actually um, to actually uh, speak about issues and how they affect them. And I want to end there. I don't want to go into very long. I know uh, people have been waiting, so let me end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Grace, uh, for uh, actually I'd like to congratulate you for having such a rich discovery from the two years, re, uh, two years review, which is also good, good practice like all the national projects to conduct following their assessment so is really useful. Now I'd like to introduce the representative from France, uh, Mr. Lucien Castex. Um, hi. Hi. Ah, uh, yeah, Claire. 
Uh, Claire Melanie Popino, I will be speaking for uh, for the French team. Uh, my colleague Lucien is still um, in in a bilateral meeting. So let me put on the camera, and sure, I will. Uh, sure, we are welcome. Okay. <laughs> Okay, is it fine for you? Uh, I saw you and okay. then you disappear. Could you try again to turn on your camera? Okay, it didn't work. Okay. I, now it works. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so I am Claire Melanie Popino. I am board member of the Internet Society of France, uh, focusing on education. And thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's a great pleasure to be speaking in Katowice uh, at the Internet Governance Forum. So in France, how did we do in a nutshell, you know? Um, starting point of our reflection is that Internet is a public good and the backbone for digitalization and digital transformation of both businesses and society. So the first step we took in France was in 2020. It was uh, really a long process with extensive delays due to COVID pandemic. The research phase restarted in late 2020 after the French second lockdown with three researchers. We consolidated our research team and it is still going strong. The framework is the Internet Governance and Regulation Research Group of the Centre Internet et Société in French, Centre for Internet et Society at CNRS. We built in an interdisciplinary team and we consolidated our multi-stakeholder advisory board, which is composed of uh, 15 people to bring the expertise of actors from the different stakeholder groups and to be able to access more data from different sources. Members include Internet Society France, the French telecom regulator, ARCEP, the employer federation representing startups of the digital industry, Sinov Numeric, as well as researchers and experts. The idea is to provide and promote a working space for the different stakeholders in France. Now, the case themes we have identified in the preliminary work. Uh, first, policies and digitalization and digital transformation. The indicators force us to look at the internet in an holistic way. Care finding during the COVID crisis is the approach needs to focus on the digitalization of small and medium enterprises and of course on digital inclusion. We have also identified a key thematic around freedom of speech and content regulation, both at the national level and the European level with ongoing discussion around the Digital Services Act DSA and uh, Digital Markets Act, DMA. We did, uh, of course, a, a policy review of the French legislation impacting internet. And in France, we have two major laws enacted in 2021, in August, uh, on the principle of the French Republic. And uh, in October, uh, it is a law on protecting intellectual property online. Another case thematic around cybersecurity uh, is, is uh, very important with the, the revision of the NIS directive at the European level, as well the thematic of online abuses and the promotion of the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, which aim at ensure, ensuring international cyberspace security. Uh, also, the Christchurch call led by New Zealand and France to fight extremist content online. We finally have an emerging debate about the environmental cost of digital technologies from 5G to data residency. And I'll stop there. Uh, we, are, we are looking uh, uh, nonetheless forward to, to your remarks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for your excellent uh, presentation. We are so happy to hear so much progress achieved in France. Now, the last but not least uh, speaker for this semantic session is from a special guest uh, representing the Ministry of Transport, uh, Information Technology and Communication from Bulgaria. 
Anelia, floor is yours. Please share with us your multi-stakeholder efforts in your country. Thank you very much, Shannon. Hello to all of you. Thank you for being with us today. The internet is much more than digital technology. It is also a network of economic and social interactions and relationships. As such, this has shown potential to enable human rights, empower individuals and communities, and facilitate sustainable development. The internet has developed rapidly into a force which continues to transform access to information, opportunities for expression, and many aspects of government and business for people around the world. It has become a global marketplace for ideas, goods, and services. It has both facilitated the respect of human rights and raised new risks. Among the challenges the need to be addressed are digital divides between different countries, between urban and rural areas, between people with higher and lower incomes and higher and lower levels of educational experience, etc. In this regard, the Bulgarian Ministry of Transport, IT and Communications proposed the measure conducting a national assessment of the development of the internet in Bulgaria through the adopted framework of UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators in the context of the fourth national action plan within the framework of the International Initiative for Open Government Partnership, thematic area, transparency and access to information. What is the public problem that is solved with the measure? The current COVID pandemic has proven that the quality of the internet environment is crucial for the proper functioning of the modern world, especially in crisis situations. Digitalization has become much more important as a factor in protecting rights and freedoms and opens new opportunities for learning, entertainment and work. In Bulgaria, there is no regulation of the internet and therefore we do not have consolidated and up-to-date information on network and quality of services, which is essential for the National Information Society policy, which should take into account in, the, in a timely manner the status and processes of technology and society development. The Information Society policy is a horizontal policy and a comprehensive assessment of the internet environment in Bulgaria through the UNESCO indicators will be extremely useful for all sector of economy, for social and technological development. How will the implementation of the measure contribute to solving the problem? through transparency, awareness, and effective cooperation of many stakeholders, government, civil society, the private sector, academia, the technical community, journalistic community, etc., for an open, globally connected, secure, and reliable internet. How does the measure relate to the values of the Good Governance Initiative? The measure is related to the principles of the initiative, transparency, civic participation, accountability, and technological renewal. The UNESCO Internet Universality Framework is a research tool for all stakeholders designed to achieve meaningful and comprehensive findings that will have real value for policymakers, regulators, and other stakeholders to improve the quality of digital policy development and implementation. Which are the stakeholders? Policymaking institutions, civil society, private sector, academia, technical community, journalistic community, etc. So far have been attracted as partners, organizations from the Public Council for Information Technology and Internet Governance at the Ministry of Transport, IT and Communications. In the board will be presented so far, National Commission for UNESCO, Ministry of Transport, IT and Communications, Communications Regulation Commission, 
National Statistical Institute, two foundations, Media 21 and Law and Internet, uh, as well as Society for Electronic Communications, CCTLD registry, our registry.bg. The proposal for a national assessment was just approved to be included in the fourth national action plan within the framework of the International Initiative Open Government Partnership. The UNESCO framework, the so-called ROAM, Rights, Openness, Accessibility, Multi-Stakeholder Model for Internet Universality Indicators is an effective and comprehensive tool for assessing the quality of the digital environment. Through national assessments, it proves its importance to society for a deeper penetration and understanding of the complexity of digital processes and the involvement of various stakeholders in its governance. From a global point of view, this is a very fruitful process of collecting and exchanging information. This is an integral part of international cooperation in the field of internet governance, building an institutional framework of transparency and improving access to information will ensure the existence of a quality and efficient internet environment. We expect this project to, to unite the efforts of the National Commission of UNESCO, the policy makers, non-governmental and civil organizations, businesses and academia for an in-depth and quality assessment of the status and opportunities for proactive and sustainable digital transformation of Bulgaria. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anelia. I think we should really give you our applaud, applaud for the, such a brilliant news that uh, you and your ministry are embracing Romex indicators in the country. And all you are saying sounds music to me. UNESCO really stay committed to providing all the support. I wish you all the success in assessing the indicators in Bulgaria. Uh, I'd like to give floor to Madame Mario uh, Oliveira again, and uh, as the one of strongest advocates and uh, support of Romex indicators and framework, and to say a few words, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shang Hong. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Shang Hong, and thank you all to you know the fantastic speakers in this session uh, and the previous session as well. I just wanted to highlight a few elements that come out that are, are really extraordinary. Uh, first, you know, uh, to echo the the interesting uh, uh, comments made by uh, Simon and echoed also by Brazil uh, on uh, the evolving nature of the IOIs towards a, a global standard that can really look at uh, um, how the internet is, uh, um, you know, the quality of the internet, how uh, Amelia just uh, uh, put it, uh, mentioned right now. You know, it's, it's really important to have this kind of standard in which we can do comparable analysis of, uh, of uh, you know, the different types of, uh, of uh, ecosystems, because actually the internet is, should be in a way global, you know, uh, ecosystem, but um, in local environments, you know, at the different local environments, it has different conditions and serves different purposes as, uh, as Simon um, has uh, pointed out. So the importance of having global, you know, global standards in which we can actually compare and help we all aim for the best possible ecosystem uh, for all of us, it's really, you know, extraordinary. So I thank you for, for that. Um, and uh, what enables us to have uh, that kind of comparability and to actually aggregate um, different uh, um, um, examples and different reports to come up with a conclusion such as this is what's happening in Asia, this is what's happening in Africa, you know, is the fact that a lot of adopters are starting or continuing their efforts to actually assess internet universality. And a central element of that is the most stakeholder mechanism. You know, it's incredible how clear it is that uh, the most stakeholder mechanism actually almost by itself 
um, brings out some of the other principles. The fact that uh, you have voices such as the voices of persons with disabilities, you know, highlights the importance of accessibility. The fact that you have uh, stakeholders from small remote communities or from um, uh, micro and small sized enterprises tells you the importance of having openness to reduce costs, to enable participation of these uh, groups into you know, uh, uh, the ecosystem in a fair way, you know, fairly and equitably with other groups as well. So it's really you know, extraordinary how illuminating this session was. Uh, the previous sessions as well. And uh, I'd like to invite all speakers and the audience as well to suggest to us tools, guidance, and elements that can help us build the, uh, um, the support system that uh, um, uh, report writers, the most stakeholder groups can rely upon in order for them to do the very best possible job of uh, assessing their internet ecosystems so that we can all benefit uh, by aggregate views, by comparable views, and at the national level, by actually national views as well. So thank you for all your brilliant presentations. This was extraordinary. I'm smiling, you know, big time, because, you know, this is exactly the kind of, uh, of conversation we should be having. So thank you and congratulations to all of you for these brilliant, brilliant sessions. Thank you, Mariosa, for all your excellent remarks and your big smiles. But are you leaving? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, because I thought we should take a good picture of all of us with uh, remote speakers uh, before uh, anyone leaves this room. So please do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we just do it now. What do you think? And then, so we ensure we have the most people here uh, and uh, don't leave. We are having a final session following this uh, photo opportunity to discuss the overarching issue of the implementation and methodology. So uh, I can ask all the also participants in the room, we, you go up here, we stand in front of the screen. And also I call upon all the online speakers. Could you uh, turn on your camera? So we take a hybrid picture innovatively for the 16th IGF. Um, may I ask our technician to help with taking a picture with my phone, okay? Hello, everyone, online, offline. When I say one, two, three, you just put your biggest smile. No, you are free to take it off uh, your mask uh, for one second for this up. Uh, hi, Cedric. Uh, hi, HTTP. Come, we are, take, we are having this photo. Please come. We are having this um, uh, hi hybrid uh, photo opportunity. Cedric, please. And you should be the center, center, <laughs> right here. Did, did, did I block you? I think we'll have the very, very inclusive one. So now I will say one, two, three. So we all smile big to the two gentlemen there. One, two, three. Can I check it? Can I check a bit? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, oh yeah, I lost this one looks great. But let me take one more backup. <laughs> Maybe 
you can take one more. You put this up so you have this screen and every people here. This. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. So, no, we are not finishing yet. Uh, Mr. ADG, could you please sit uh, in front with us? Uh, we are having the final semantic session to discuss the um, implementation process and uh, methodology. Uh, yes, please sit down. Um, I think we are having uh, only 22 minutes, and then we have uh, four speakers, and also we have uh, Mr. Taufik Jelassi to address the closing remarks. So let's let's be quick, everybody. Um, three minutes, if we could. So now I'm introducing the first speaker, Mr. Shavka Sabirov, the president of the Internet Association of Kazakhstan. Hi, sir. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. So, so please take the floor to share your experience and your suggestions on the implementation of a Romex indicator in Kazakhstan and your overall uh, review and the comments, suggestions on the way how we can really improve this national assessment process. Floor is yours. Thank you. At the first, uh, let me just thank you for uh, organizers of this meeting because it's very, very uh, useful and helpful for us. Uh, we are working uh, close to three hours, so I try to be very brief and uh, short. As the first is, uh, let me say, uh, I'm not going to repeat all uh, just general words about uh, universal indicators because everyone uh, knows about them. I just like to point uh, to a few moments. Kazakhstan is a regional leader of, in ICT field in uh, Central Asia. So uh, for pandemia, uh, we think that uh, internet became as a single link uh, for billion internet users to media, to information, to shopping, to business for everyone. And also for Kazakhstan, we have a huge uh, territory. It's Kazakhstan is the ninth territory uh, over the world. And uh, we have only 18 million people population. So it means uh, sometimes uh, distance between uh, cities or villages it's about two or three thousand kilometers. So uh, sometimes to get the internet or any information, it's just internet, it's just a single way. So uh, uh, that's why for Kazakhstan, it's more important to get uh, this research, uh, to get indicators. And also we are going uh, to include uh, some additional points such as uh, IX centers, internet exchange centers in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, for example, tomorrow we have a meeting with ISOC about IX in uh, Kazakhstan. So uh, the next one, uh, internet in Kazakhstan just uh, gave to us uh, a lot of information. As I said before, uh, in uh, traditional media, we have uh, over 95% is a government media. In internet, we have over 85% is the independent media, and only only six or seven percent of government media. It means internet uh, bring us uh, uh, freedom of expression, additional information. And also, uh, we have to think about uh, companies of uh, digital communications, which uh, came to direct 
uh, connection to freedom of speech, as we see to our social network, uh, where digital the companies of digital communication can uh, be uh, as a moderator. So uh, we have enough enough examples over the world. Uh, for blocking uh, any pages for some commentaries of people. So uh, in Kazakhstan, we just see for the last two or three years, the law comes very, very strong in the internet. And I think the same situation in uh, our neighborhood countries, including China and Russia, we have uh, two big countries from the one part is uh, China, or another part is uh, Russia. So uh, we have to get a balance uh, between uh, two countries and, and try to keep, uh, still to keep our freedom. Yeah. So uh, the internet, it's, uh, is more, it's really important in Kazakhstan. So uh, I think, uh, we are going to all procedures uh, through the research, organizing the multi-stakeholders advisory board, uh, creating methodology uh, to ask uh, analytics uh, to work uh, close to analytics groups and get uh, the total uh, re recommendations to our government and uh, NGOs, what's going on with, it, with uh, internet in Kazakhstan, because uh, uh, we have to understand where we are right now. And also uh, during the pandemic, uh, we uh, have to present uh, our research uh, for business as well, because the business uh, just uh, increasing. So I tried to, be very, very short. So uh, thanks again uh, for this event. And uh, we will uh, start hopefully our project uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shavka, for sharing so valuable insights from Kazakhstan. I'm actually also inviting my dear colleague, Mr. Sergei Kapov, who is the officer in charge of UNESCO Amati Office Communication Information Program. He has been really coordinating a number of Rome uh, projects in the region. And um, Sergei, now you are ready? Yes, please take yes. the floor. Thank you, uh, Shenyong. Uh, UNESCO Amati Office cover Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, four countries. And I would like to present some trends and uh, challenges in the region. First of all, uh, only Kyrgyzstan have pluralistic and media environment, uh, including public service broadcasting and community media. Number of internet users are growing, especially mobile users. Mobile payments is growing as well. But uh, at the same time, pressure on media and journalists is increasing. Self-censorship at the editorial boards is growing. Uh, stagnant financial crisis in independent media and also growth of uh, disinformation against the background of local conflicts uh, on the borders and situation in Afghanistan. Talking about uh, uh, internet users and issues of Central Asia, I, uh, in Central Asian countries, digital transformation started uh, at, uh, at last, uh, for the last few years. Uh, including of Rome principles, right, openness, accessibility, multi-stakeholder participation, and artificial intelligence started by UNESCO since February 2020. Internet universality indicators will take care about uh, the process in Kazakhstan in 21, uh, uh, started in 21, uh, but it will continue till 22. Uh, Shafkat Sabirov just mentioned uh, about uh, his efforts on uh, building multi-stakeholder participation. And some numbers, you could see the Kazakhstan uh, have uh, 18 million people, Kyrgyzstan six, uh, uh, or close to 7 million, Tajikistan nine, and Uzbekistan 34 million. And also at the same time, you could see the coverage uh, of internet users, uh, 80, 
2% in Kazakhstan, 70% at Uzbekistan, uh, 38 in Kyrgyzstan, and 22 in Tajikistan. You see the variety uh, of, the, of the region. Also, if you could see the gross national income per capita, you would understand the situation in the country. Universal access to information and fundamental freedoms are not seen as a right of the regional residents. Uh, women and vulnerable groups and as a tool for their self-development, reinforcing gender inequalities and the weak engagement of vulnerable groups. The inclusion of people with disability, we are open solutions at the beginning of the implementation and UNESCO Almaty is doing some efforts on that. Linguistic diversity is limited to state languages. Media and information literacy, including digital literacy, just observed as a tool for resilience and uh, in face of misinformation, hate speech, and violent extremism. This is uh, the trends and also the problems. Talking about activities we do, uh, some events uh, of uh, CI program in, from since 2018 and the current year, we just uh, completed assessment of journalism safety situation in Kazakhstan using UNESCO journalist safety indicators. Also just launched uh, the media, uh, going to launch in uh, February 22, media development indicators uh, in um, um, Kazakhstan, as well as uh, uh, same indicators in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the neighbor republic. Um, we are focusing on inclusion of learners with disabilities and open and distance learning, as well as artificial intelligence and uh, translation of important MOOCs and courses, including gender mainstreaming indicators and other 56 in, uh, publications in two local languages. Recently, we introduced Internet Universality Indicator for Russian speaking countries. It is the reason why you can see the Cyrillic letters on the uh, Rome logo. We call it Poduk because it's a different pronunciation and different letters. This is more or less what we do and what kind of tools we uh, uh, translated the series of publications to assist media developers and uh, uh, researchers of internet. And the guidelines are available in local languages, including Kazakh and uh, also Kyrgyz language. And uh, what we are going to focus on, we are going to promote these four priorities for the, to support communication and information in Central Asia, building inclusive knowledge societies and universal access to information with a special focus on SDG 16.10.2, freedom of express, expression and safety of journalists with specific SDG, media and information literacy and inclusive digital transformation. This is more or less what we're going to do without a lot of details, just the general overview of, of the process in Central Asia. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much, Isaki, for having been a driving force of Rome and also the entire CI in Central Asia. And now I'm inviting my dear colleague from UNESCO office, Cairo and the South Sudan, Mr. Ayman Bandari. Are you with me? Are you online? If Emma has an issue of connection, now I'd like to invite our last speaker, but really not the least, um, Madame Nashlongo from uh, Namibia. Is she in the room? Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw her. Okay, so uh, since we are lagging a little bit behind the schedule, uh, I wouldn't uh, be able to prolong the schedule further. Now I'd like to give the floor to our last speaker, Mr. Tofik Jelassi, UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Communication Information to address a few last words. And before that, I'd just like to report you a bit uh, for the session because before you came, 
we had uh, 25 speakers uh, having a very intensive presentation representing the national assessment of role mix in, uh, in 25 countries. And only three of them, they couldn't uh, connect in. That's also, again, show the power of the internet. And now I'd like to uh, really uh, thank all the colleagues. Uh, they are so committed. They are staying with us for three hours without stop. It's the passion. So um, Taufik, thank you also for you for making time for us. I know you have a busy schedule today. So please uh, tell us what you think about this project and share your vision. Thank you very much, Xian Hong. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, both uh, physically with us in the room at IGF Poland in Katowice, but also all of you connected online to this session. Uh, thank you for your contributions. Thank you for the panelists and the speakers, because this session, of course, has a key objective, which is sharing information and also disseminating best practices when it comes to the internet universality indicators and the UNESCO Rome X principles. It's only when we collectively exchange, share, and stimulate our thinking that we can inspire the action and that we can inform policy making uh, and decision making down the road. Uh, clearly, we all know that uh, the, the, there is a methodology, but there is also a process related to the internet universality indicators. It's very important not to know about what these indicators are about and what benefits they can help us achieve, obviously, but also to understand the methodology and the process, how to get there, how to use them to conduct a national assessment. Because at the end of the day, it is by informing policy making that we can all uh, achieve the type of benefits and the type of outcomes that we expect out of this work. So I think this is very important. And UNESCO mission is, of course, to serve member states, to empower countries on using uh, in a humanistic way. This was emphasized. I heard it, and that's what the Rome principles are about. A human rights-based, open, accessible, and truly multi-stakeholder multi and inclusive approach to adopting uh, these indicators and to having a national digital strategy that meets uh, the set purpose. So I think the, the in-depth reflection that took place this afternoon, the exchange, and I saw people from all over the world uh, taking the floor to share with us uh, uh, what they have done. I think the, the outcome is inspiring. The ideas are to be followed up on uh, in order to, uh, to, 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 to have the type of internet governance as well. It's not only about national digital policy, but it is also to have the proper internet governance and the proper internet development, both at, at a national level, but also further afield globally. I would like here also to reiterate our invitation to all of you to, to join, uh, obviously, the, our dynamic coalition, Internet Dynamic Coalition, which was set up uh, last year. And you have a number of countries who have joined, but of course, we would like to be inclusive and to have other uh, countries uh, joining our dynamic coalition on the Internet universality indicators. I think this is very important development. Uh, launched, as I said, by UNESCO at last year's uh, uh, Global Internet uh, Governance Forum. But uh, I think we, the more members we have, the better it will be, because clearly we can, as I said, have a mutually reinforcing message, and we can support each other through the information sharing and uh, the best practice dissemination. Uh, let me say that uh, we have a number of sessions that UNESCO has uh, prepared for this IGF forum in Poland. And uh, of course, you are most welcome to join us for the dynamic coalition meeting, which uh, will take place this Thursday, December 9, uh, between 9.30 and 11 a.m. So please try to, sp uh, to spread the word and try to join us for this important session, which is very much a continuation of what has been uh, presented and uh, explained this afternoon. 
let me uh, in wrap up because I see that my time is up. Let me here say that um, it is only through our collaboration and cooperation to mobilize the tools uh, uh, which we have at our disposal, such as the Rome X indicators that we can together uh, develop the internet that we wish to have, the internet that we want to have, an internet, as I said, that is truly a human rights based, open to all and accessible by all, but also following a multi-stakeholder approach that is not only led by national authorities and public sector, but involving also the private sector, academia, civil society, uh, digital companies, internet companies. I think it is only through that truly multi-stakeholder approach and consultation that we can achieve the objectives that we set for ourselves. I will uh, continue to follow uh, your exchanges, your interactions, and the consultations that uh, UNESCO has initiated and hopefully that together we can achieve the set objectives. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. ADG, for all your strong support and sharing your vision and the advice, which are super valuable to all of us for the next step. And may I make an apology because I have my last speaker from the previous session, Madame Nashlongo Giovasio, coming back. So if you allow me, I'd like to give her two minutes to express you and also to share us the multi stakeholder participation and also project in Namibia. Yeah, please come. Yeah, yeah, please come over to here. Uh, you have a pre presentation, or no, not really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, um, Dr. Xiang Hong and uh, previous speakers and all our previous speakers that have been joining this session um, virtually, but also in the room. Really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Nashilongo Gervashes. I am from Namibia. I have, I wear many roles, but amongst others, I'm the founding president of the Namibia Internet Society chapter and currently also founder, um, founding member on the Namibia um, Internet Working, um, Internet Governance Working Group. Um, for Namibia, we haven't yet started with the Romex assessment. Um, we're looking forward that uh, now that it has been mentioned for Namibia, um, we particularly are um, excited for this assessment for the country. Um, we have noticed a number of development within the country, um, uh, policy um, positions, um, but also um, bigger developments. For instance, this year, our president has um, um, announced or have set forth a, a, um, a national assessment, like a national assessment for the 4IR, um, of which I, um, I'm, I'm pleased to be having um, appointed as well. Um, but other than that, we have learned a lot of lessons here today from other countries that have done the assessment and um, provided us an opportunity to um, to engage especially for us as we as we undertake the assessment next year um, we particularly looking forward to um, constitute our multi-stakeholder um, advisory board what we have learned from here in the room um, to be very con in uh, inclusive of all sectors from civil society to the private sector and the technical community but also very um, academia. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, we also looking forward to include a um a, um, a stakeholder, not other, just the stakeholder methodology that is con inclusive of, of everyone and um, that is taking multi um, dimension approach. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you, Nashlongo. Give us the strongest message at the end. You know, uh, I'd like to make one more apology that today we're having 25 strong speakers present. It's an overwhelming presentation. I am speechless. I'm just uh, feel that uh, so thrilled by the power of romics by the efforts extraordinary efforts made by all our national speakers national researchers and your uh, stakeholders and also we heard the good news from bulgaria after three years multi-stakeholder dialogue we get to the kickoff of the assessment in the country of bulgaria now we look forward to good news from namibia and then i have um, one more uh, last message of thanks to my to our technical in the room. 
actually I have bothered them from early morning to, to ensure we have all the PPTs to be presented, all the, uh, the sharing screens. Thank you so much for being so efficient and so helpful to make this hybrid super successful. And um, also I'd like to thank our speakers online as well, all the participants in the room, as well my colleagues, Karen and uh, Stephen, who have helped us to report on the session to, or to organization. So last, uh, I still apology, we have no time for discussion, but as ADD said, we are having a dynamic collation rolling out on Thursday, 9.30, please join us. I'm, I will ensure we have more discussion. And the UNESCO team, my colleague Cedric, and um, our director who just left, we are all here in idea for a few days. I'm ready, we are happy to provide more support if any country, any in stakeholder want to uh, seek more in help from us to support you on this project. So thank you. Let's maybe let's have a, a applaud for all of us, for successful all of us.